I want to welcome everybody to the November 18th, 2021 Planning Commission. I hope everyone has a safe holiday coming up with your families, uh, Thanksgiving. I know personally I smoke my own turkey, which is always my fun part of Thanksgiving. So I hope everyone enjoys it. That's probably out of order, but um, I appreciate everybody coming down to this venue. Um, and so we're going to have to go a little slow today because uh, we got a couple of housekeeping items. So the first is commissioners on the mics. Um, we have a staff member that's going to um, push the button for you to speak. So what <laughs> I'll try to, it might be a little difficult. So if you want to speak, raise your hand so that, uh, and then we'll try to take you in order that you raise your hand. Okay. And then I'll try to keep, keep up with that. So I know that's a little bit different, but the mics are a little different than our normal meeting area. So um, I want to thank everybody for coming down. And so our first order of business, um, and, and the other thing here, so here's another housekeeping item that I need to announce too. So um, we, it, it's still, uh, we're in another building that's part of the school board's building. And so um, we all have to wear our masks. So I appreciate everybody doing that. I know there's some conflicting um, state law, but um, for now, <laughs> right now, the courts have established that we need to wear our mask in here at this point particular point. So I appreciate everybody doing that. We have masks. Uh, the team, if you don't have a mask, the team will get you a mask. And I think everybody has one. So thank you for, for doing that. It's a little tight spacing. So appreciate everybody doing that. So, all right. So we are now um, onto the adoption of the agenda. The agenda commissioners, the agenda was sent out to you earlier. Um, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Is a proper motion? Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. Um, next is the approval of the October 28th, 2021 minutes. Those were also sent out prior to the meeting. Uh, and is there a motion to adopt the minutes? So moved. Proper motion, and is there a second? Second. Proper second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the minutes are adopted. And then next is the council members, uh, recognition of the council members. And, and um, we do this um, as we see you all come in. And so the first council member I saw was Councilman Hager. See, there he is. He's behind the computer. Welcome, Councilman. Thank you all. Allow me to be here. Um, I've got 24A, 24B and 24C, I believe they're on consent, uh, but I'll wait around and make sure that it goes through. And then the other one is uh, number 31, and Councilman uh, Glover will be carrying that bill since uh, I have a conflict of interest on it. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. And we, I don't think anybody has pulled those yet, so thank you. Next, we saw, I saw Councilman Cash. Come on up. You want to speak now? Thanks. Uh, I uh, am here. There's a, uh, items 20A and 20B are, they're in Councilman Sledge's district, but it's right across the street from mine. And I've had some meetings, and I think the um, applicants have done a great job of listening to all, all the neighbors on both sides of 12th and coming up with a good plan. So I'm in support. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate that. Next, Councilman O'Connell, welcome. Thank you. They told me this is where I come to talk about masks in schools, and I've got a few things to say about that. <laughs> oh, gosh. My, oh, no, I've got the notes wrong on this. I'm sorry. Okay. Me. Um, I've got cases 2021-Z012-TX001. Uh, I know you all had the opportunity to consider this item uh, at your last meeting, and I'm grateful to staff and commissioners for ensuring that all perspectives could be heard on this matter. Uh, this bill arose from a neighborhood conversation that has now drawn on for years, and we've had a couple of different approaches. Some are on the table. Um, this approach uh, that was kind of a, a, arose from a working group uh, in Germantown that involved uh, residents 
residents, realtors, investors, uh, has also had a lot of interest from other neighborhoods. And it simply seeks to apply an existing parking standard from one commercial hospitality use to another equivalent commercial hospitality use. Um, I know there have been some studies of the amount of ride sharing and other ways that short-term rental guests uh, arrive and use their uh, accommodations, but neighbors in any neighborhood that has a complex of STR-only units can tell you that the reality is that non-owner-occupied short-term rentals consume parking voraciously. Eventually, I think Nashville might reconsider our overall parking minimums more holistically. Uh, until then, though, I think applying our current standard uh, consistently will offer neighborhoods relief. So thank you for your consideration on that one. Uh, the next is 2021Z018TX001. Uh, my colleague, Councilmember Taylor, uh, has brought this bill. And I just wanted to provide some context as I'm very familiar with the nature of his concerns. Um, we share a boundary uh, basically along the interstate between our two districts and along the Buchanan Street corridor, which runs into the Buchanan Street Business District, uh, an emerging mixed-use corridor, one of the most popular recent uses has been nightclubs. Unfortunately, this use has not proven particularly compatible with the single-family residential fabric, frequently one to two properties removed from the nightclubs in question from a quality of life standpoint. And so Councilmember Taylor is seeking to provide a buffer for this specific use. So encourage commissioners to consider the nature of the concern here and support it or uh, possibly offer Councilmember Taylor and, uh, and my colleagues some guidance on other ways we might address it beyond simply enforcement. Uh, our enforcing authorities in Metro are not demonstrating facility at resolving quality of life concerns and I'm not optimistic about near-term improvements in that regard, so appreciate your consideration on those two items and thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, next, I saw Councilman Sledge. Let's see. Thank, thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Chair. So a couple of items um, in District 17, I'll actually work backward. They're all on the same block. So in 21 and 22, those are Southgate Station amendments. Those bring the zoning in line with the Wedgwood Houston Chestnut Hill uh, UDO rezoning that we did. There are several residents, I think, who wrote in and residents who are in a attendance tonight and support. I'm having an open dialogue with the ownership of these, um, addressing some of the issues that were in some of the letters that you received. However, it's my understanding that they are not coming in opposition tonight. We're continuing to have that open dialogue moving forward. So I'd ask that you support um, tonight. And then on 20A and 20B, as Councilmember Cash mentioned, that's the uh, 12th Avenue South of Tabernacle Baptist property. For those of you who are familiar, we are in year seven of conversations about this property. And I do think that the applicant and the ownership group that's worked on this has done a really great job. Um, still very small things to work out there, but I think we are in a really good spot um, for approval tonight, if you agree. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. And I didn't see any other. Oh, oh, Council Lady Van Rees, it's good to see you. You were hidden but you back. You can't see me in my shirt, can you? I can't. <laughs> you know, I was trying to read the newspaper the other day, and my I had to get some readers. I, I, would, I, I apologize for the uh, Las Vegas Aces uh, T-shirt, but I am wearing Predators and uh, soccer team blue, uh, yellow, so I'm, I think I'm safe. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to just bring to your attention uh, a project uh, item number 27, uh, a request to rezone at uh, 115 and 117 East Campbell Road and 226 Old Amqui Road. Um, this is an application that was in at your uh, last meeting. I was unfortunately out of town and unable to be present. Uh, there was a, a neighbor that had some questions. I believe that they've all been answered. Uh, I know that there's uh, an, another neighbor here to speak in favor of it tonight if you need to hear from them later. Uh, but I offer my support to it. I, I literally live within walking distance from this. Um, old Anqui Road, a lot of folks know about Anqui Station. They don't realize that Anqui Station was at a place called Anqui. And uh, Anqui... Um, Old Anqui Road actually is uh, near that historic uh, location. Uh, it's kind of an old forgotten little um, cul-de-sac almost really, a little dead end street down there. Um, and uh, there's an opportunity for us to bring uh, new um, uh, housing to the area without gentrification and uh, to protect uh, a lot of the um, uh, beautiful uh, kind of green space
space that's in that area, uh, provide uh, additional uh, infrastructure, and uh, and really beautify the area. Uh, I'll also include uh, encourage the applicant to work with the Tennessee Housing Fund uh, to be able to see if we can be able to uh, provide some of these uh, units um, uh, available uh, for beautiful market rate houses um, with some uh, assistance from the Tennessee Housing Fund. So with all those things that we have going on, uh, I appreciate uh, your consideration for it and ask for you to move it forward. Thanks. Thank you, Council. I appreciate you coming down. All right, any other council members? Bob, Lisa, make sure I got everybody. I think I did. We did? Okay. All right, so we'll move on to item E, which is items for deferral withdraw. Lisa? The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Item 1A on page 3 of your agenda, 2007 SP 037002. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. The associated case item 1B, 95P025007, Millwood Commons PUD cancellation. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number two on page four of your agenda, 2015 SP 013004, Stevens Valley Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Item number three, 2018 SP 009003, Sage Run SP Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th, 2021 meeting. Item number four, 2021 SP 052001, The Cottages at City Heights. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. <laughs> Item number five, 2021 SP 063001, Charlotte View West. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 13th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2021 SP 057001, Marina Grove. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number seven on page five of your agenda, 2021 SP 068001, South Street North. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Item number eight, 2021 SP 080001, Cawthorn Property. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Item number nine, 2021 SP 082001, The Preserve Lot 2. <coughs> Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 10, 2020, 2022 SP 001001, Formerly 2021Z108PR001, Jocelyn Hollow Court SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 11, 2021S207001, Donegan Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number 12 on page 6 of your agenda, 2021Z013TX001. Staff recommendation, it's a text amendment related to um, inclusionary housing. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 13th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. Item number 13, 2021S195001, resubdivision of lot one of resub of one and two Hyde Park. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 25 on page 9 of your agenda, 2000, uh, 2021 SP 067001, West Side Retreat. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item 26, 2021Z 070PR001. It's a rezoning on Hills Lane. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 28 on page 10 of your agenda. 2021Z114PR001. It's a rezoning request um, on Crutcher Street. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 29, 2021Z118PR001. Uh, it's a rezoning request on Buena Vista Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 32 on page 11 of your agenda, 89P031002, 
Smith Springs commercial PUD cancellation. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number 33, 2021S, 210-001, Zero Brick Church Pike subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number 35, 7871P, 7874P004. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number 36, 2021 SP 081001, Oliveri Mixed Use. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Lisa. And so let's go over which, we'll go over these slowly because uh, a long list. So Lisa, make sure I'm correct here. So the items for deferral withdrawal are items 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 25, 26, 28, 29, 32, 33, 35, and 36. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral or withdrawal. Is there a motion? There's a proper motion and a second. Is there a second? Second. Second. Proper motion. And any discussion on the items for deferral withdrawal? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred. We are now on to item F, which is the consent agenda. Lisa? As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I'm going to read through the item numbers and case numbers for the items that are on the consent agenda. If there is anyone here that is in opposition, please raise your hand. If not, these items will be placed on consent. Item number 14, 2021 CP 008004, North Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item 14? Item number 15, 2021 CP 013002, Antioch, Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 15? Item number 16, 2020Z 014TX002, a text amendment related to dark skies. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 16? Item number 18, 2021Z018TX001, a text amendment related to bars or nightclubs. Is anyone in opposition to item 18? Item 18 will be presented. Item number 19, 2021Z019TX001, a text amendment related to non-conforming structures. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 19? Item number 20A, 2021CP010002, Green Hills Midtown Community Plan Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item 20A? Item 20B, 2021SP071001, 12th Avenue South SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item 20B? Item number 21, 2015 SP 037003, South Gay Station Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 21? 
Item number 22, 2016 SP 013003, 522 through 526 Southgate Avenue Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 22? Item number 23A, 2021 SP 046001, Summit View SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 23A? Item number 23B, the associated case 2779P001, Summit View PUD cancellation. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 23B? Item number 24A, B, and C, 24A, 2021 SP 062001, 4321 Old Hickory Boulevard, and the two associated PUD cancellations. Is there anyone in opposition to 24A, B, or C? Yes. Those items will be presented. Item number 27, 2021Z, 105PR, 001, a rezoning on East Campbell Road. Is there anyone opposed to item number 27? Item number 30, 2021Z, 119PR, 001, a rezoning on Ashland City Highway. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 30? Item number 30 will be on consent. Item number 31, 2021Z, 121PR, 001, a rezoning on Old Lebanon Dirt Road. Is anyone in opposition to item number 31? Item number 34, 2021S, 219, 001, Sherwood Homes at Park Preserve. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 34? Chairman, I will now read through the um, captions for those items. Oh, well, I'm sorry? In opposition to number 34? No, not opposition. Not opposition. Okay, so it'll stay on consent, not in opposition. Okay. Okay. I will, I'm going to read through the, um, the, the captions now, so bear with me for a moment. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number 14, 2021 CP 008004, North Nashville Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to, re to amend the North Nashville Community Plan by changing from T4NM to T4NC policy for properties located on, North, on 9th Avenue North and Clay Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 15, 2021 CP 013002, Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan to adopt the Murfreesboro Pike Bell Road Study Fact Sheets and Supplemental Policies for various properties located on Murfreesboro Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 16, 2020Z 014TX002. It's a request to amend the zoning, the zoning code related to the application of dark sty regulations. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page seven of your agenda, item number 19, 2021Z 019TX001. It's a request to amend the zoning ordinance related to the limitations of rebuilding a non-conforming structure. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 20A, 2021 CP 010002, Green Hills Midtown Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the Green Hills Midtown Community Plan by changing from T4RC to T4NC property or policy and to amend the building subdistrict designations. Staff recommendation is to approve the policy change along with minor changes to the 12th South Avenue, 12th Avenue South Corridor Detailed Neighborhood Design Plan. Item 20B, 2021 SP 071001, 12th Avenue South. It's a request to rezone from R8 and CS to SP for properties located on 12th Avenue South to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page eight of your agenda, item number 21, 2015 SP 037003, Southgate Station Amendment. It's a request to amend the Southgate Station specific plan for various properties located north of Southgate Avenue uh, to prohibit 
short-term rentals, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 22, 2016 SP 013003, 522 through 526 Southgate Avenue amendment. It's a request to amend the 522 to 526 Southgate Avenue SP for various properties located along Southgate Avenue to prohibit short-term rentals. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 23A, 2021 SP 046001 Summit View. It's a request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning for properties located at 211 and, I'm sorry, 2111 and 2115 West Summit Avenue to permit up to 112 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The associated case 23B, 2779P001, Summit View PUD cancellation, a request to cancel a planned unit development on properties located on West Summit Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 27, 2021Z105PR001, it's a request to rezone from RS20 to RM9NS for property located on East Campbell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 30, 2021Z119PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS15 to RM9NS for property located on Ashland City Highway. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 31, 2021Z121PR001. It's a request to rezone from MULA to CS for property located on Old Lebanon Dirt Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item, item number, uh, um, I'm sorry, on page 11. Item number 34, 2021S219001, Sherwood Homes at Park Preserve. It's a request for concept plan approval to create 26 single family lots. Uh, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And on page 12, under other business, item number 40, to accept the director's report. All right, thank you, Lisa. And so uh, we'll go through these slowly. I know that was a, a long list and some have been taken off. So let's go through these commissioners slowly and let me know if you have questions. So the items that will be on the consent, approved on the consent agendas are the following. Items 14, 15, 16, 19, 20A, 20B, 21, 22, 23A, 23B, 27, 30, 31, 34, and 40. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Commissioners, you've heard the items to be approved on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? That's a proper motion and a proper second. Any discussion? Yes, Commissioner Blackshear. Recused from 34. Oh, hold on. Let's get you on mic. That's okay. Okay, go ahead. You can go okay. say it again. <laughs> Sorry. I'm recused from number 34. Thank Thanks. You. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Sorry. The so before we um, speak, you know, it takes a little bit of time, and so we'll just have to go slow. All right. So we uh, there's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items will be approved on the consent agenda. So now we're on, on to item. Uh, so let me say this about what we're going to hear before we get into item G. Uh, so, Lisa, that means we will hear items number 17, 18, and 24A, B, and C. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Whoops. Hold on. Is that correct, Lisa? That's correct, okay. yes. Thank you. And so why don't we do this? We'll let kind of just we'll, – we're not going to take a break. Just let's let everybody uh, – exit the room and if everybody could do it as quickly as possible we appreciate it so we'll just wait a few seconds but before we so um before we start i saw a few more council members walk in and so yes council a porterfield hello welcome and but first i, I 
I saw uh, Councilman Parker, I think, first. Do you want to go now or do you want to? Okay, all right. Council Lady, you, are, you, are you ready to speak? Go ahead, welcome. Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to uh, thank you all for passing the first item that we had, which was on the consent agenda. I know there was a lot of work done around that community, um, the, the Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan Amendment. Um, and I specifically wanted to uh, thank Anita for her work around that. So thank you so much. And then I also wanted to confirm that the PUT cancellation um, on Smith Springs Road, which is item number 32, that that uh, will still be deferred uh, to the December 9th meeting. All right, thank you so much. All right, Council Lee. So items 15 was on the consent agenda and then item 32 was deferred. Thank you, okay, perfect. All right, so that I think we're ready for you, Greg. So Mr. Claxton is gonna, um, we're gonna, we're on item G, which is the, our redistricting briefing and, and public comment. And our director just came in. And so welcome director, how are you? Glad you could make it for this discussion. We appreciate it. And so, um, a couple of things I want to say before Greg gets started. Um, I'm really proud of the team and Greg um, for all of the transparency around this process. We're still working on it. Obviously, there's been a lot of public input. Um, and so I know the commissioners have been involved in a lot of discussions um, on this matter. And so I want to just say before you get started, Greg, thank you for all your work. I know he's kept me apprised and the director um, and so thank you, and you may begin. Absolutely, uh, thank you, uh, commissioners. Um, my name is Greg Claxton. I'll be presenting your uh, briefing on the redistricting process. Um, as you know, redistricting is the routine redrawing of political boundaries every 10 years following the census. The Metro Charter assigns the responsibility for local redistricting to the Metro Planning Commission to make a recommendation to council. Uh, we are focused on two bodies, the, uh, the Metro Council uh, districts themselves, as well as the school board boundaries. A couple of things I wanna uh, make sure that everyone is aware of that we do not address are the state and federal uh, district boundaries that's handled by the state. Um, additionally, while we're uh, looking at the school board district boundaries, nothing that we do applies to attendance zones. So no change that um, you would contemplate would change where uh, children attend school. Um, this process formally kicks off when we received the uh, census data that came out in August of this year. Um, we were actually able to get, get started a little bit in advance of that. Um, in July, we launched our website to provide, uh, to start briefing people on the history of redistricting in, in Nashville, as well as the criteria, the factors that we look at, that sort of thing. We also launched a community input survey, uh, m uh, partly to get people thinking about redistricting and the role of their community and their their council and school board districts, but also so we could start sort of building our interest list so that when, when it was time to move, we kind of already had a group of folks that we knew were interested in following the process. We received the uh, census data in August. We put out a memo outlining kind of the growth and change in Nashville, and then got underway with um, pre uh, preparing draft maps in September. We released uh, our, our initial draft maps in October, and we've been kind of going through public feedback and a second draft since then. Um, we're now gearing up and preparing for the adoption process, and I wanna walk through that in a little bit more detail now. Um, so uh, the, per the charter, the Planning Commission makes a recommendation to council, um, or the timeline is that uh, you have uh, within six months of receiving the census data to do that. Uh, once you have made a recommendation, it goes to Metro Council. Um, however, uh, council's role is somewhat limited. They uh, may adopt or reject uh, Planning Commission's recommendation, but may not amend it. If council rejects the recommendation, it goes to a public referendum. Uh, if it does that, the council can also submit its own plan to public, to public referendum. Um, our goal is to bring a, a, a redistricting plan to you to recommend to council that enjoys broad support. Um, now, once a, a redistrict, redistricting plan is adopted, the Elections Commission goes through a, a process where they have to redraw uh, precinct boundaries and issue new voter registration cards. 
Their hope is to be able to do that well in advance of the next election when people have to start uh, qualifying to run for that. That's the school board in August of 2022. So working back from that, we have a practical deadline of around February uh, of next year for new uh, boundaries to be adopted. In addition, elected officials will continue to represent their current districts until the next election. So this doesn't sort of snap into effect and people have to sort of familiarize themselves with new parts of town. It will uh, kind of really take effect um, in August of 23 for the council and August of 22 for the uh, school board. Um, the fundamental thing that we're tasked to do in redistricting is to bring the population of district di different districts uh, closer together. Uh, this is called kind of the deviation from ideal or the average district size. Um, so the map up here shows uh, council districts. Um, we have about 5%, uh, plus or minus 5% from the average district size that we can work with. Uh, the districts in yellow are within that appropriate range. The districts in blue are uh, below that threshold. The districts in orange and red are above that threshold. Now, one thing to be aware of is all of these districts need to work together um, kind of numerically. And so just because a district is in yellow now and within the, the appropriate range doesn't mean that it wouldn't necessarily change. We find that changes in one district very quickly sort of start a domino effect and affect other districts as well. Now, as we begin redrawing district boundaries, seeking that, that better population balance, uh, we're looking to keep districts compact and contiguous. That is, we try to avoid funny shapes. All parts of the district should touch. We try to keep districts where they've been historically. We try not to move people uh, without cause into a new district. Um, as part of that, we also uh, seek to avoid putting uh, two incumbents who are eligible to run again into the same district. Uh, we must comply with Voting Rights Act, so we're prohibited from drawing district lines in a way that uh, dilutes the ability of minority communities to elect the representatives of their choosing. And then we seek to uh, uh, keep uh, communities of interest intact. That could be a lot of different things, but in practice it's mostly keeping neighborhoods together. Um, all of these pull in different directions, and so um, one thing that we frequently see is there's always compromises in any particular map, so no map will be perfect. Um, in addition to the uh, council district boundaries, um, the school board uh, uh, deviation shows a similar pattern of sort of being light in population on the north end of the county and heavy in population on the, the southern end of the county. As we've been uh, working with the public on this over the past uh, couple of months, um, you know, we frequently hear concerns about the extent of changes or different communities kind of being put together and just concerns at, at how much change is going on. Um, we know that that's a tough thing to work through. Uh, we, we've kind of talked through with a number of people over the past uh, two months. One thing that helps to convey the scale of what's going on is the range between the smallest and the, the, the largest district size. So that range is intended to stay b uh, below 10%. That's that plus or minus 5%. Uh, for us today, for Metro Council districts, the largest district is about 40% larger than average. The smallest district is about 17% uh, below uh, the average district size. And so the range is about 60%. To put that in context with other cities, we looked at wherever we could find what the starting range is for other cities. And you can see they are by and large well below that. Um, we couldn't find another city with a range as wide as Nashville's is. Um, so all of that is just to say, if it has felt tough to the public at times, it is because it is unusually challenging for us, as far as I can tell. Um, so with that in mind, the public engagement that we've done, like I said, we started over the summer with an interest in community survey. We got about 600 responses. That also helped us build our, our interest in email list. Uh, we released our first draft, Proposal A, in, on October 15th. We had four community meetings throughout the county. We had an online survey and took email comments, as well as drop-in hours at our office and a virtual event. I'm gonna pause for a moment. <laughs> um, about two weeks ago, we released Proposal B for the council districts. Earlier this week, Proposal B for the school board. Um, and immediately began sort of collecting feedback on that, primarily through our online survey, emails, and drop-in hours at our planning office. 
uh, proposal B is still open for comment. We are still welcoming any further uh, thoughts, questions, clarifications that people have. So far, we've received 132 comments on that. Most of those were within the first few days. Um, I say that because as we look ahead to the adoption schedule, our hope is to release our third draft uh, by December 3rd. We'll take comments through December 7th through an online survey and drop-in hours. And then we hope to have it ready uh, for you to consider for action on December 9th. I'll talk through what that looks like in more detail at the end. Uh, when we receive public comments, we put them all into a database. We try to organize them by either topic or, or district. And then we assess them. Like if there's a specific requested change, we go into our redistricting software and see what is the effect of that change on the population balance. So that helps us understand, does this put a district over or under population? And then we can put it in context of other requested changes. So any one change is likely to put the districts out of balance. But we look for three or four or five that work together to help, us, uh, help guide us to a new draft. Um, so I'm going to go through the drafts that we've had so far. I'm going to touch on these quickly because they're difficult to sort of take in at the countywide scale. <laughs> um, these are the current council districts. Um, generally, the big thing that we were trying to sort through here is the imbalance between the districts north of the river, which are collectively light on population, with the uh, urban core districts that are overpopulated and the southeast districts that are overpopulated. And so we looked at a number of different ways of bringing them into balance. But ultimately, the thing that put fewest people into new districts was to relocate District 8 from Madison to Southeast. So this was Proposal A. This was what we went out to the public for two weeks with. We got a lot of feedback in all parts of the county. Where we could, we incorporated that feedback and developed a second draft, <laughs> Proposal B. So this is the draft that we are still taking feedback on. Um, generally, in most of the county, uh, things seem to have quieted down. There are still a number of areas that we're hearing kind of consistent uh, concerns about. Uh, one is the, the line between District 1 and District 3 in Whites Creek. The second is uh, boundaries in Madison around due west and the commercial corridor. Uh, a third is the lower portion of District 5. And then a fourth is kind of the areas around Glencliff, Radnor, and the East Thompson community in dist around District 16. Uh, for the school board, these are the current school board districts. Um, I will say at the outset that there has been a lot less uh, commenting on the school board. I think that's, that's in line with past experience. Um, one of the things when we briefed the school board in this room over the summer they requested was that we looked at um, aligning their districts more closely with the, their attendance zones. Now, again, I want to <laughs> be sure to say that we are not changing their attendance zones. We are taking their attendance zones into account in drawing these boundaries. And so that was what we did. We uh, made a big step forward in most uh, clusters to have them lined up with particular school board districts. And then as we moved into Proposal B, we found a couple of uh, small places where we could continue to make improvements there. Um, in terms of next steps for the public, we are still taking comments on Proposal B through November 29th. Our hope is to release Proposal C by December 3rd and then take comments through December 7th. That December 7th, we've, been, we've tried to be very accepting and accommodating to comments like whenever and however they come in. That December 7th is, becomes a very important deadline for us. Um, we think we can get the responses that we need over that weekend. We think Proposal B showed that. Um, it also helps us prepare to bring amendments to y'all uh, for you to consider on December 9th. We need a little bit of time to test the requests and to make sure that like two or three requests still work together. So then for the commission, uh, we'll be ready to have you uh, start reviewing public comments on Proposal C starting December 7th. If there are particular changes you would like, a, like to consider, please let us know as soon as you can. And then we'll prepare uh, amendments and assess the population balance uh, for you to consider on December 9th. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Greg. Um, and so, commissioners, we'll, how about we, so this is, this only happens every 10 years, obviously, and so kind of a new process um, for us, and I appreciate Greg kind of leading us through that. 
Um, and like I said, I, I really appreciate all his hard work and the team. Um, there's a lot that goes into this and it's a really complex issue. But tonight, um, we want to get a lot of um, feedback from, from the public, the council members, and obviously they'll deliberate in their own body as well. Um, and then at the end, how about we, um, after we hear all the public comment, then just kind of like, like we do for a hearing, we can ask questions. Now, our attorney, Mr. Alex, says that we can't deliberate, but we can ask questions. So if you have questions of the staff, uh, the team, or anything, write them down now so you don't forget. And then if, um, and then we'll go last. And so um, we'll let the public go first, just like we always do, then the council members, then us. And then we'll hear this at the December meeting. And that's when we'll deliberate and vote on the proposal so that we can meet the deadlines. All right, so we'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. And so um, anyone wishing to speak, if you'll just come up to the mic uh, of the public, then we'll do the council members. Um, and, and so um, the timer is right here. Um, we might need to kind of twist the timer for, so that the public can see it, Bob. Uh, a little bit. There we go. And so everybody will have two minutes to speak. And so come on up. We're ready. Anyone wishing to speak on the redistricting plan for the council districts? And or the come on up. Don't be shy. And then if you'll just state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Uh, Michael Maples, 4010 Brick Church Pike. Thanks, Mr. Claxton, for late night um, emails and all that stuff. This is hard to get out to the community. If you have the maps in front of you. Can we bring up Proposal A? Well, yeah, well, Greg will. There we go. All right. My main concern is the, the west side of District 3, east side of District 1, the line across White's Creek Pike. Previously, in the original... Uh, our current council district, District 3, carves into White's Creek Pike, which is much rural land and uh, low density, if you will. Proposal A came out, and because of the obvious density change in, in uh, the last six or seven years in Nashville, it, it um, consolidated the size of District 3, and Proposal A draws a line right down Brick Church Pike. The east side of Brick Church Pike is very dense, um, Two, two houses per acre. The west side of Brick Church Pike is, is rural, much like what's going on over in White's Creek. There was a, a campaign by a government official to uh, can include that, uh, that part of the land and draw the line up I-24, which divides off the much rural um, area from, uh, from what, what was previously in our district over in, in, in the Whites Creek area. That line of Proposal B did get moved over to the I-24, and everyone down the west side of Brick Church Pike and many right on the east side prefer pr uh, Proposal A, where the line gets drawn down Brick Church Pike. It, it, it makes sense on every uh, facet of, of what Mr. Claxton said goes into considering how to redraw these lines. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ingrid Campbell. I'm within District 5. I'm also the president of McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association. First, I wanted to thank Greg Claxton for dealing with my phone calls and listening to the community because Plan A split our community. And I got an earful. So he got an earful. But Plan B, we're back together again. I wanted to speak on behalf of the neighborhood to let you know that we understand the history of District 5, District 6 as well. We understand that for decades, that area may have not been the prime, pristine area that you would want it to be. But it's getting there, and quickly. And people like that, and they see that. And those that I have worked with who have been in the neighborhood 30, 40, 50 years also want to enjoy that. One of the things that 
we want to do or continue to do is be involved in the River North and East Bank project. We are the neighboring communities that are directly affected by those projects. And we want it back in District 5 and District 6. It is important for the community to feel as though they should, they should reap the rewards as well as they have endured so many of the not so good side, things that have happened. But I have told them on behalf of them that I would fight for that. And that's why I'm here. And um, Council Member Withers and uh, Council Member Parker, thank you for allowing me to sit on the boards that are working on these projects so I can get back to the community and let them know where things are progressing. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Rutledge. I live at 508 North 2nd Street uh, in Council District 5, and I'd like to thank my Neighborhood Association President, uh, Ingrid, for saying a lot of the stuff that I'm going to reiterate already. So uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, thanks to Mr. Claxton for all the hard work he's put in, uh, and also that it is good that my neighborhood, McFerrin Park, has been restored, but there are adjacent neighborhoods like Maxwell Heights and Greenwood that deserve full representation as some of the few remaining truly diverse neighborhoods in East Nashville. I think all the neighborhoods south of Briley are going to be immensely affected by the developments at River North and the East Bank, and we deserve to have as loud a voice as possible in the, over the way that development unfolds. In the last redistricting, the river was recognized as a natural boundary, and the 6th district was restored as a fully East Nashville district. So my question is, why are we reversing that precedent now by drawing an unpopulated area into the downtown district? The planned infrastructure connecting our neighborhoods to the River North area under the interstate will connect us even more closely to the East Bank development, so there's even less reason to silence our voices by removing the proposed developments from our council district. And since there's virtually no population currently in the footprint of the East Bank and River North areas, drawing it back into districts five and six could be done easily without throwing off the numbers, so I request that we please do so. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ethan Link. I live at uh, 4912 Ruskin Avenue. Um, and uh, until recently, uh, I was a resident of District 5 in Cleveland Park um, for about 10 years. Um, and uh, I moved earlier this year into District 7. So I've uh, had the great good fortune of having two wonderful council people, very uh, uh, attentive and responsive council people. Um, and uh, what I've come to ask uh, about tonight is, and it's difficult to talk about it without um, the proposal uh, kind of zoomed in, but I can speak a little bit to it, is uh, why the, the two neighborhood associations or two neighborhoods in District 5, uh, Greenwood and Maxwell Heights, are still split um, in Proposal B while District 5 is continued to go further north uh, above Briley. Um, having lived in both uh, East Nashville, Lower East Nashville, Cleveland Park, uh, I got to know my neighbors by folks walking up and down uh, the sidewalk. Now I live in District 7, um, and uh, the community up there, I'm more likely to see a deer in my yard than a person. Uh, so there is a very different communities vastly different needs, particularly with infrastructure between the area in North Inglewood and Southern Madison than it is in uh, Cleveland Park. Um, a, a very easy correction would be to restore um, the uh, Greenwood and Maxwell Height uh, communities, restore them to District 5, and that should be able to bring out the uh, parts of the district that have crept above Briley and uh, north of, um, or north into South Inglewood, or North Inglewood, I'm sorry. Um, so my request is I will continue to, I'll come by planning and speak more on it later. Thank you. Uh, come on up, welcome. 
Good evening. My name is Michael Rivas. Thank you all so much for the hard work that you're doing. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I live 327 Gray Street, also in um, McFerrin Park, District 5. Um, and I just want to uh, say again what, what has already been said, just so that everybody knows that we really do feel strongly about this, uh, about the, the new projects that are being developed um, along Dickerson um, and, and over on that side. So I uh, just wanted to lend my voice to that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this issue? All right, let's let's do the council members. So, um, and the council members, if if you'll raise your hand, who's here that wants to speak on on this subject? Is all right. So, let's let's go in the in the same order that I saw you. I don't. Is Councilman Hager still here? I, he would you like to go first? We'll go in the same order. On the redistricting. On the redistricting. Yeah, I'll talk to I'll, I'll talk to Mr. Clax, and I'm getting together with uh, Councilman Evans, and we'll get together and discuss that with him. But I okay. appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right, Councilman Cash. Thanks. I don't have a lot to say, but I do want to. Uh, I uh, praise Mr. Claxton for his work on this. I think he's been thorough, responsive, and fair. Um, I've talked to him a couple of times about what I, what I think some of my constituents thought were big issues, but were easily fixed, I think. Um, and I, I, this has been a great process. I'm hearing you know, from like state folks about their process, and uh, I'm thankful that we have the process that we do, that, that you all um, oversee as opposed to you know, a purely political body that has a big stake in it. So I want to thank Mr. Claxton and thank you all for, for doing this process. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman O'Connell, is he? Nope, OK. Is Councilman Sledge here? There's a lot. Of, nope, OK. I can't see behind the podium. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> biggest podium in the world. OK. All right. Councilman Parker, you want to go? Come on up. All right. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. And um, I also want to begin by thanking uh, Greg and the team that's been working on this. Um, you know, Greg has always been very responsive to my emails, but somehow in the midst of this really complicated process, he's been extraordinarily responsive to my emails. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, and, and I know that um, a lot of my constituents have come and, and met with you all and talked about the proposals and the concerns. So thank you so much for listening and taking those into account. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to beleaguer all the points that were made by my constituents. I think that, you know, my, uh, the, the proposal as it stands, you know, my concerns with it are mostly about um, established neighborhoods being split up. Um, you know, these, the, these are, uh, I know that there are a lot of neighborhoods that are split between council districts throughout the county, but these are, when we talk about Greenwood and Maxwell, these are very small neighborhoods um, that have um, very tight relationships and, um, you know, also just as a practical matter, um, two council members scheduling um, to attend their monthly meetings is just a lot of demand of, um, of two people. Uh, I think I have about five, just within District 5 as, as it stands, about five um, monthly neighborhood meetings that I do my best to attend every month. And then there's another two to four, depending on the, on the quarter. Um, who meet sort of ad hoc or, um, when things are going on or when there's an issue we need to address. So um, that already is an extraordinarily busy um, schedule. And, and having two members try to do two or more of those, it just seems, it seems very difficult. Um, I also, uh, one, one of my constituents spoke about the sort of communities of interest, the, the, the character of um, you know, this, the area north of Briley, which, you know, if it is included in District 5, I look super duper forward to, you know, meeting those people and learning more about the area, but I'm somewhat familiar with it now, and the character really is, you know, it's, it's acre lots, it's, it's intense segregation of uses, so you've got, you know, very much residential-only neighborhoods with very little commerce, very little of the, um, uh, what one of my constituents talked about, the sort of walking on the street interaction, you know, where you're maybe more likely to see a deer I don't see too many deer in Madison as I do in like Inglewood, but um, what I'm getting at is, you know, these are acre lots all around, deep segregation of uses. Throughout District 5, we have 
mix of uses. We have you know quarter acre smaller lots um, throughout, much much denser, much more walkable, um, and and I think that really um, is is sort of a difference of of character between sort of the area north of Briley and the neighborhood south, um, as well the the I also believe that the East Bank and River North projects should be included in East Nashville districts. Um, I think that this, the process that we have engaged with as a community to sort of shape the, the plan for those areas, um, there's been a lot of buy-in from East Nashvilleians. Um, it's, it's difficult for me to see shifting the sort of political accountability of that process across the river. Um, into the downtown district. I think that I understand the thinking behind it now after having discussions with, with staff, um, but I think that there's no issue with having um, intense urban areas in more than one district in Nashville. Um, and, and I think that um, not having any East Nashville representation as those projects move along is concerning to me. So I would ask again, staff and the commission when it comes to y'all to please take a look at our neighborhoods to the south of the district. Um, really do whatever possible to keep those intact. Um, please restore the East Bank and River North areas to East Nashville districts. And beyond that, I'm, you know, my feelings about the district stretching north, you know, as far as is necessary to balance population is, is reasonable, you know. So if that includes Madison, it includes Madison. If it's Heart Lane, that it's Heart Lane. Um, so I think that there's probably a lot of wiggle room in there, and I just hope that um, staff can continue to work. I know y'all will to, to try and address some of those concerns. So again, thank y'all for um, being here this evening, and thanks again to staff for all their hard work on this so far. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Porterfield. Thank you. I'll be very brief. My comments uh, mirror my colleagues, Councilmember Cash. I just really wanted to uh, thank Mr. Claxton for all of his uh, hard work. Um, we did have a community that uh, in Proposal A was carved out of our district uh, due to the balancing of numbers and was placed in another district. Um, and there were a lot of broken hearts around that. Um, and I was able to work with Mr. Claxton as well as with the community. And we were able to uh, restore our unit and get, um, get that community back into the district. So I just wanted to publicly thank Mr. Claxton for all of his hard work because I know it's not easy trying to balance um, everything on a citywide level, but he's just done such a phenomenal job with working with uh, communities and working with council members. And I look forward to continuing to engage my community around Proposal B. Um, and Mr. Claxton, you'll be hearing from me if there are additional concerns. So thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, and then we had um, Council Lady Van Rees. She want to come on up. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that I'm, I'm still the council member for District 8 um, until the next election. Um, there's been actually some confusion on that, so I, I want to make sure that people understand that um, I'm uh, very excited about uh, the next couple of years and making sure that we get it right. Uh, I um, uh, don't want to be the only one up here, Greg, but my goodness, I thank you so much for doing an amazing job. Um, uh, no one understands quite how hard it is other than council members, and so we, we mean that with all our heart. Um, there's uh, been a lot of change, obviously, and at this point, the current District 8 is in three different uh, districts. And uh, it's important to understand that a lot of the growth in District 8, particularly um, near um, Ben Allen, Broadmoor, um, uh, what will be coming to heart, but Ben Allen, Broadmoor, and then also along the corridors of Gallatin Pike and Dickerson Pike have not yet been realized. And so, although approved and um, planned and some permitted, um, none of those new residents are in these numbers. And so I know that uh, you guys can't take that into account, but what you can take into account is the, the transit corridors and um, the 
uh, inevitable discussion as we move forward in regard to new transit plans. And Gallatin Pike and Dickerson Pike are a huge conversation in regard to that. Um, so um, the commercial corridors that are about to become residential corridors does need to be taken into account. Um, I am really uh, pleased with the work that uh, Councilmember Hancock and Councilmember Benedict and I did uh, to um, working with this um, uh, planning staff on the uh, uh, commercial design overlay along Gallatin Pike, which really uh, uh, moves forward the discussion in regard to how we want Gallatin Pike to look. Um, the same uh, situation has happened with Councilmember Benedict on the UZO extension up to um, Dickerson Pike. So I think that all the bones are there for uh, the appropriate growth, but it's important that as you're looking at this redistricting um, process, uh, that uh, that you do keep in mind that um, uh, the idea of transit corridors being part of the discussion. Um, one change that I'd asked for in Plan B was just a very simple um, uh, push up at the current plan anyway of seven uh, is stopping at the current Woodruff, um, uh, soon to be David McMurray Way, um, uh, at Madison Station Boulevard uh, to go ahead and get that up to Old Hickory Boulevard because uh, that Madison Station Boulevard um, is um, needs to kind of stay intact uh, for representation as it uh, moves forward into its new um, sense of place. Uh, there are no people that live there. It's this where the Kroger is and there's a train track. I think there, there may be a, a one apartment building there, but, um, but very like less than 20 people, I think. So, um, so I wanted to make sure that, that that is taken into consideration. I know that one of your, um, obligations is to not make, um, funny looking districts, but you know, you know look at that there. Some of them are funny looking. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if you could, um, uh, take that into consideration as you're moving forward in regard to keeping continuity along Madison station Boulevard and, uh, uh making sure that you're mindful of the transit corridors as you're moving through, I pledge as a outgoing council member, um, to work with whoever and whatever neighborhoods, uh, is representing it, um, uh, upon passage into to the next election to make sure that people are meeting the right people and we're having those discussions uh, consistently and uh, ongoing. And that um, probably will be a lot of what I do the next couple years. <laughs> so um, pray for me. Keep me in mind. Um, uh, when I first ran, I was running for District 4 10 years ago and you guys moved it. So I, I tend to have this weird thing happen to me. Um, so uh, now 4 is in Brentwood and 8 is now. Um, but uh, I, uh, hopefully 10 years from now, it won't be quite as dramatic but I'm, I'm counting on whatever is along that Gallatin Pike corridor in, in, in particular and the Dickerson Pike corridor is going to have massive growth. So I'm just hoping that whoever's there doesn't have to get moved to Antioch again too. So <laughs> um, thank you very much for your time. Those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Council Lady. Appreciate that. And then I, I thought I saw uh, Council Lady Hancock. Yep. Come on up. How are you? I would like to join the chorus of thanks to Greg Gladstone for the great work he's done. I showed up at the Madison planning session at about 2.30 or 3 that Tuesday and stayed till 7 and had no idea that he was going to make me a worker bee and um, started <laughs> shuffling people around and finding out which district they were from and letting them look at different maps. It was a lot of fun, a lot of education, and just amazing how much work the entire department has put in and the computer program that we've got going on and how fast they could take folks' suggestions and, and input them in and talk to them about the balancing of the district. So I really do appreciate all the work that has gone into there. Now, being a council member in Madison for District 9, I am the only council member that serves only Madison. So I've got potential as we move forward of about 21,500 constituents, all Madisonians, for a small city within Metro of less than 40,000. So I do have like 55% of Madison, and I'm only thinking Madison all the time. Madison was Brexit before Brexit was cool, right? In 1962, when we did the vote, 51% voted to join Metro, 49% voted not to. We joined. Some people still remember that uh -huh. and are grumpy, so please keep that in mind. Um, I'd like to make four points. 
um, with the district after I explain to you a little bit about my district. I am one of the most diverse districts in the city. Not many people realize that. There are two districts that can rival me in um, diversity, which is District 29 and District 33. And District 28 has me beat hands down. But Madison in District 9 is 35% white, 37% African American, 25% Hispanic, and 3% other. We are very diverse. About a third of our residents are from there and stayed there. Most of them came in from being pushed out of East Nashville or being pushed out of Inglewood. Um, so this is a you know, straight to the heart discussion um, from my constituents. One of the rules for redistricting is to keep it compact. Don't make it strange shaped. I totally agree with Council Member Van Reese that downtown Madison should stay together. And I think it should stay together in District 9 so that this very diverse community can have that voice for the businesses. I do not think those three blocks should be extended. I think those three blocks that are currently in District 7 or across Skeleton Pike should be put in District 9. That way it's a cohesive unit, not a strange shape at all, and it's historically where it has been. Second point, you're supposed to keep districts historically where they have been. Until two censuses ago, this district went all the way to the railroad tracks. And in 2000, we cut out a little bit of the business in 2010, a little bit more. Now the proposal for the 2020 census is to cut out even more from this very diverse community. I strongly urge you not to do that. We do not need to dilute the minorities in communities. Now, granted, there's only one, as Council Member Van Reese mentioned, apartment complex on Woodruff Street, which has 14 um, apartments, so there's not many residents there. It doesn't really affect the numbers, but it affects the community input and the community voice from this minority community where they can have influence in the community and in the business district when it's their district. When it's not their district, the people that have influence are majority in Inglewood, and that's not what Madison wants to be. The next and fourth point here is to respect communities of interest and keep neighborhoods together. This is a downtown business neighborhood. It's currently split on Gallatin Pike. We're asking to split it even more. And I urge you to make it cohesive and unified so these businesses can work together to better and improve Madison, our very diverse community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, we, any other council members? I want to make sure we get everybody. I don't see anyone. All right, we'll do the same for the uh, school board members. Are there any school board members in here? I don't know. All right, seeing no school board members. All right, we'll declare the public hearing closed, and then we'll get to, how about we go to, we'll just do our normal process. Vice Chair, do you want to go first? Any questions? Remember, we can't deliberate, but we can ask questions. Is this on? It, maybe. <laughs> they control it. Get, get okay. it closer to you. You've got to talk real close to it. Now am I on? Yeah, you're on. Um, so not deliberating. I, I mean, I think I have to process all of this. I, um, I mean, I, I think there were some really good arguments made. Um, you know, we had that work session a few weeks ago and we talked about the fact that the future of downtown was a downtown that the river runs through it. So in that context, I, I you know, I want to think about the East Bank, um, but I thought the comments that were also made were, were really helpful in that. Um, and I think the comments in Madison are really helpful to think about. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, when we have the public hearing in a couple of weeks, we can get into more details. Okay. I'm afraid if I talk and then we mess up the yes. system, it'll go off or something. Um, you know, this is a lot to take in. The staff have been marinating in this for weeks. And so if, if it pleases the commission members individually to ask a question, great. If not, and you just want to think and then reach out to us over the next week or two with any follow-ups and more detailed questions or issues you want to put on the table, that's totally fine. When we do bring it back on December the 9th, that, that will be a deliberation. And so I think if there's anything that comes to you before then where you really have a substantive issue you want us to dig into or explain, I would ask that you reach out to us if it's not 
raised here. So the next couple of weeks, I would like to read everything, but then I probably will have some questions about the thinking sure. behind, you know, at least a couple of the, the, east, the east side changes that were talked about. So it's really important, commissioners, that, you know, we have a timeline because of the school board August election, okay? And so I ask everybody, the team and I ask that, and, and Greg, that you really take a deep dive um, so that you don't feel, un I mean, I'm not, I don't want to rush anyone, but that's, the issue is us trying to meet the deadlines. And we've had a workshop on it, and we've had lots of public input and that's why we're, we're getting the council members and the public to talk to us to, to really address that. We've had 500 and some comments, Greg. And so we're down to kind of getting, I think, I think it's a testament to the team. But if something really bothers you, you know, call, call the team, call Greg and, and the director set up a meeting. But I urge you to try to get, take that deep dive over the next two weeks. Um, when you get bored with your family on Thanksgiving, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, but I'm serious though. You need, we're, it's, it's time to, to move on this. And that's why we, I want to get the conversations out now so that we can figure out if, if anybody has problems. So, all right, Greg. Hey, commissioner. First, I would like to echo everybody's praise on our staff, uh, Greg Claxton. I mean, you have done a phenomenal job, and it's, uh, you know, lots of taking, lots of load. I really appreciate that. And also, you know, uh, posting the comment uh, between A and B, I mean, personally, it's really helped because it uh, explained to me how the change was made and what community was input. And then in that, it has like a, a imposed uh, map, so why the line was shifted. So my you know, uh, request to council member or community, if you have a certain like a neighborhood you wanna put together, that would be so helpful. Hey, this is the you know our, our neighborhood association boundary. So therefore, we don't like this you know street coming in the middle and split it. So let's put together. So if you know more information uh, provide kind of help us to understand. I mean, I'm intimately familiar with my district uh, 23, but other than that, it's a little bit hazy. So those superimposed uh, boundary and more input from council member definitely helps because council member in each district intimately knows the boundary. So I really appreciate, you know, a council member being in here and, you know, uh, having input. So I would like to ask and encourage uh, those council members more to give input to you know, our staff so we will understand. So my understanding, uh, December uh, 7th, uh, we will have proposal uh, by uh, December 7th. And then uh, December 9th, and we will be uh, getting ready to adapt. Uh, in that time, we may have still a little bit adjustment. So when we have adjustment, I would like to request like a superimposed you know, area so we will know the exact line we are talking about. But otherwise, I am so thankful for all the hard work of the staff. Yeah, the director. Sorry. I just want to make sure. Whoa! I just want to make sure I have understanding. So on the on the ninth during the the commission meeting, you would like to have a map available that is superimposed on a detailed street grid, so that in the event we want to discuss an amendment or something like that, we can zoom right in and discuss. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Um, just want to thank not only Greg, but we actually had a whole team of planning staff who came out to all those events and were very patient, uh, spent lots of time with one. So I want to make sure that all of our staff are recognized, even if not by name, that we have a whole, a whole body of people that did lots of great work to make that happen. Um, uh, 
uh, one thing, this is not a, a deliberation, but just uh, from, uh, as a council member, you know, just a statement I think that I would like to make or remind us all of, is that uh, we do re redistricting um, for community representation, but not for council members themselves. And so council members do have, you know, insights about community cohesiveness sometimes that may not always be obvious, but uh, this body and even the Metro Council as a whole uh, is gonna make a decision for the next two council terms. So technically no sitting council member is gonna be the council member for the entire time that these districts are in place. We really need to think about that long-term um, representation of those communities. So just wanna throw that out there. I know some of, some of my Metro Council colleagues have stated that they do not want to comment on this process specifically for that reason, that they don't want to be um, sort of uh, picking and choosing their own voters. So that's, um, I, I think, an admirable sentiment uh, to make for council members. But um, other than that, just wanted to thank all of the staff who worked really hard. Um, and I know that um, the boundaries uh, in, in East Nashville are still a little bit fluid um, uh, and Lots of folks have been participating in the in the hearings that we had, as well as in the online comments, and those those comments are really helpful. Um, I think particularly the written comments help all of you as commissioners to see uh, what the concerns and interests are, and those written comments are, are very valuable. And I, I think it's neat that they're very public this time, so uh, that really helps this commission to make uh, a very transparent decision at the next uh, December 9th meeting. So, but thanks again to everyone. Commissioner Hanley. They'll turn it off for you. Nope. Try it again. Testing. Okay, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Awesome. Um, again, with the, with the confines of not deliberating, I, I will just say that a lot of the comments that I've heard um, brought forth this evening, both from the public and, and council members, reflect a lot of what I've heard um, over the time period. But in terms of a question, I do, I do have one, and it, it's meant to be one that I think we contemplate uh, very thoughtfully. With the December 3rd date being the date of release for Proposal C, um, and then it being kind of capped on the 7th and then brought to the body on the 9th, I, I'm just really curious in terms of how the feedback, if it's you know skewed one way or the other in terms of quite amount, quite a large amount or quite a few, um, how that will be perceived. And, and I, I guess I'm asking the question not just to you, Greg. I know you're here as a representative, but I, I mean as a body, because I think there, one of the great things that's happened is over this period of time, the community, at least and people interacting with me, have said they've had time. I mean, it's a lot to take in. I think, as, as my fellow uh, commissioner said, uh, you know, four or five days seems very quick. Now, I know the community is plugged in. I know there's been a lot of communication and a lot of effort. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that our, our representatives and community leaders are going to make sure that everyone's aware of that. But I'm just really curious when you go from having kind of big chunks and weeks of times and office hours and then you put that last thing out there and then it's like, go, 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 go right after Thanksgiving. I mean, I think that can be perceived possibly as a negative. Um, and so just want to prepare this body and to start thinking about that and just maybe if there's anything we can do or, or want to do um, just to get out in front of that. So I, I just, I'm just curious if, if you guys have thought, I'm sure you have thought about it. Sure. Um, um, thanks, Commissioner. Um, it is something we've, we've definitely uh, considered and thought about, um, kind of the, the timing and sort of the quick turnaround. Um, it was very much something we were uh, watching when we, re we released Proposal B. Um, one thing that we did um, we, when we released that, um, and we, got, we did get some questions from the, the public about that, um, is that we, we sort of said, hey, we want a quick sense of, of how people are reacting to it. We're not gonna set a deadline, but if you can sort of let us know in the next few days, um, you know, and that, that, what that did was um, we saw a lot of very immediate responses Friday, Saturday online. Um, the Monday was the highest traffic sort of day we've had in, in terms of our drop in hours at, at the office. And, you know, when I go back and look at the, the feedback that we got, um, it is things that we've consistently heard in the, the week and a half, week since then. And so it, it was sort of a proof, proof of uh, concept for us. Uh, to see, you know, are people able to sort of, now that they're plugged in, they know what's going on, they have a sense of how their concern connects to the, the, the draft boundaries. People are by and large able to go in pretty easily and see, 
did this change? Like, was that, does that make me happy? Does that, you know, does this change upset me more? I think the, the areas that we're gonna need to be very careful about is any changes um, to areas that haven't been highly under, ha haven't been highly discussed yet. And so we're thinking about that as, as we prepare for the rollout for December 3rd. Um, you know, what does that look like? How do we make sure that everyone, you know, where there's a change, everyone who's going to be affected, how can they know as quick as possible? So, so the one thing, um, too, Commissioner, that um, we have to take into consideration is during the December, you know, we only have one December meeting, and so we, we potentially could call a special meeting, um, but in terms of trying to, you know, I know your time is valuable. We, we really try to condense, people are on vacation, travel, not vacation, traveling for family. Um, and so we really try to, I know it's a condensed schedule, but if, um, you know, if the commissioners think that it's important enough to call an extra meeting, you know, we have to think about quorum and that sort of thing. So it's another just, I, I know it's very condensed. So that's why I'm asking the commissioners and, the public and the team, you know, let's try to keep it in the normal confines of, of, of the current meetings that we have that are on notice. Because then we have to send out another notice. And so I, I do worry, I always worry about that stuff, Commissioner. But um, if that is a concern of yours, let, let the director know, you know, you and I can't talk about that directly because of Sunshine Law, but tell the, tell the director and we can discuss it, okay? Perfect. All right, Commissioner Haynes. No questions at this time. All right, Commissioner Sims. Am I on? Um, I, just like everybody else, I want to thank Greg. Um, but I, 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 when you're listening to on TV, you don't. There's a big disconnect often, and I think particularly in our notes about what we're actually doing. So, what everybody's really thanking him for is that we are really are trying to reach a substantial equality of population with a whole lot of variables in there, and doing it in a quick timeline and on budget and trying to get all of Nashville to agree to this. I don't know of very many people that would even tackle that, Greg, so I just want to thank you very much for what you're doing. And uh, we stand ready to be instructed by you, and I say that humbly, and if there's anything we can do to help us get through this, it's a big job in a city that's growing so fast that almost by the time we draw these things, it may be out of date, so it's a big job, and we thank you very much. Commissioner Black? No questions. Chair does not have any questions. So commissioners, thank you. Try to um, take a deep dive on this. I, I know many of you have already, uh, and that's why we've tried to really extend the process, you know, from the summer to now. And so I appreciate all the commissioners and all the council members and the, the school board members having meetings with, with Mr. Claxton and the team. The team's done outstanding. I think it's a testament that there's only, you know, five um, uh, five members of the public commenting. I think that's impressive. And I think we're starting to kind of feel where the districts are and, and the communities. There's obviously, uh, when you move one, everything else kind of shifts in these maps. And so, you know, I, I think the team has done an outstanding job in trying to, um, and I used to be one of those um, council members that had a lot of questions and, and that sort of thing. And so I appreciate the team um, working with the council members on that. It means a lot to me. So. Um, I think it's testament, director. You should feel proud of your team. Yeah, let's. I think we should give Greg a round of applause. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. All right, so that concludes item G, which is our redistricting briefing and public comment. And so now we're on item H, which is the public, other public uh, hearing portion of our meeting. And I think we are ready on item number 17. Dustin Shane, staff planner, and this is a text amendment under Bill 2021-831, and this is a request to amend the ordinance 
uh, to amend the definition of short-term rental property not owner occupied and to amend the parking requirements for STRP not owner occupied. So some background, um, STRP owner occupied in a lot of the city's experience uh, doesn't tend to overly disrupt neighborhoods and their tempo and character. However, uh, STRP not owner occupied can have varying effects. Uh, right now these uses are only permitted in mixed use and commercial areas. However, the parking requirement on these uses is the same as on a single family home. Uh, so this, um, in, in, now experience varies, but this doesn't tend to match the reality that residents are witnessing with this use as far as how parking is used. Um, so the analysis is, is, is that more parking is needed. Um, so this amendment goes in and it defines STRP not owner occupied as a um, commercial use and then it goes on to establish appropriate minimum parking requirements in line with that. Um, so that looks like in, in this amendment, it's one space per bedroom or sleeping area. Um, there was some confusion with some of the opposition that this was stricter than what's on hotels right now, but this is the same requirement that's, that's put on hotels in the zoning ordinance right now. Um, so what this would do is help reduce the parking spillover that residents in nearby areas and, and users of those neighborhoods have witnessed. And it would also get the parking more in line with how these uses are usually uh, used. So our recommendation is to uh, approve the changes to Title 17. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. And I believe the applicant is actually the council member, right? Yep, so Councilman O'Connell is not here. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, gave, he gave comments at the beginning of the meeting in regards to this item. Exactly. Okay, perfect. And so, um, so we'll go ahead and, and start the public hearing. Um, and so anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. So yeah, come on up. It'll be the normal thing, two minutes each. Um, if you're in support of the proposal, please state your name and address. And um, the, and, and, and if y'all could line up kind of, that way you could, we'll get it going. Anybody wish to speak in support? All right, go ahead. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Ron Hogan. I'm the president of the uh, Historic Germantown Neighborhood Association. I'm also on the uh, working committee that uh, Freddie mentioned, or Councilman O'Connell mentioned uh, recently, that uh, it was comprised of uh, realtors, residential, uh, and uh, commercial builders, and me. Uh, the, I have had a short-term rental permit myself, and uh, one of the realtors has a non-owner-occupied short-term rental uh, existing uh, permit today. So we know what uh, we. I shouldn't say we know what we're talking about, but <laughs> we're familiar with the issue. With over 30 restaurants in Germantown and uh, the parking overflow from the Sound Stadium and uh, the Bicentennial Mall, so the parking's been an issue, a premium issue uh, for us for several years. Uh, now with the influx of uh, short-term rentals with no parking requirements, and I, uh, you said it was the same as a single family, but. We had a 13-unit uh, non-owner occupied short-term rental complex that was recently uh, built in Germantown, and each had four bedrooms. It has a total of 52 bedrooms. And if these were residences, they would have had, by code, uh, single family would have had 26 parking sites required on site. Uh, they applied for their permit. The uh, and we think that they, we couldn't find anything in the code with, uh, with this. So uh, the zoning administrator, if there is nothing, the zoning administrator specifies that, uh, or the code specifies they shall apply parking permits for a like use. We don't know what the use is, but the total, uh, the parking requirements for that unit, those 13 units were 13 parking spaces on site. So a reduction of 13. With 52 bedrooms and a potential capacity of up to 156 people in that complex if they're full, which granted that's gonna be unlikely 
and only in a few times, but there are only 13 parking spaces on there. The resulting overflow under our streets just in this one, one case will be significant. And not only was this, in our estimation, an, an inappropriate designation, uh, it, it gives the uh, zoning administrator with no if there's, if there's nothing on there like we don't think there is. He can just decide willy-nilly what, what the parking, what, the, uh, what a like use is and what the uh, on-space parking would be. I think the, the term arbitrary and capricious comes to mind at least to me. Uh, Non-owner-occupied short-term rentals are really more akin to bed and breakfast and these require one parking space per bedroom <coughs> on site. It's the same as the bill. But even as you mentioned <clears throat> earlier, that uh, hotels and motels are required to have one on-site parking space also. Uh, that may not be, I'm not sure if that's the case in downtown quarter, but it is everywhere else. So, and as the staff said, uh, the parking requirements or mirror those of hotels. So we we feel this is a very appropriate uh, bill, and uh, finally the uh, we also support the the deletion of the term or the definition of residential from, from uh, short term rental non owner occupied, and once property becomes a non owner occupied short term rental, it becomes commercial. So if you take residential out then you, it becomes whatever that, that is, residential or commercial. So the uh, Historic Zoning Commission urges you to pass it as it is introduced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? And I, I'm assuming there's a lot of folks. So here, here's the situation. Um, we try not, since there's a lot of you, we obviously, um, two minutes, state your name and your address, and then try not to repeat yourselves. I appreciate that and all of the commissioners. So come on up. We welcome you. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jake McDonald. I live at 196 44th Avenue North. I'm here to speak on the unintended consequences specifically as it relates to the Councilman O'Connell's bill on short-term rental parking. As I reviewed the public comments, there was very limited support of Councilman O'Connell's bill. In fact, there's only two comments uh, in support, one of them being specifically related to 1325th Avenue North, which is a property we own. 1325th Avenue North is zoned MUN. It is parked per code. It is zoned for short-term short rental. It is not an SP. We secured a bu building permit. We secured a final CO. We secured short-term rental permits, except for an initial issue with the tra trash collection. There have been no complaints. We are very sensitive to potential parking needs for this project, and because of that, we regularly go by this property early in the morning to gauge the amount of parking utilized for the property. The property gets extremely high utilization and occupancy and very positive remarks from its visitors and even some neighbors. With, the, uh, with this high occupancy, we expected there may be parking issues. We have a commitment from the operator, which is Sonder, to provide off-site parking on an as-needed basis for this project. In fact, when we go by there on Saturday and Sunday mornings, it is rarely uh, more than 50% full. The reality is most people who come to Nashville use rideshare apps or cabs to get to where they're staying and where they're going. This is a bill created to solve a problem that in most cases does not exist. What this uh, bill does is cause significant financial distress for literally hundreds and maybe thousands of properties in Nashville and the bill will impact the value of the property and the ability to secure a mortgage um, or to resell the property at some point in the future. At the very least, all existing properties sh should be grandfathered in in perpetuity so that those properties and the voters that own those are protected. We recognize that the staff supports this bill, but at a minimum, we suggest that significant additional studies should be conducted over the next 12 months to determine whether there is a problem. Thank you. Name is Darren Cunningham. I have property at 1000 12th Avenue South in Nashville. I'm also a resident of Mount Juliet, uh, where I actually am a planning commissioner in Mount Juliet, so I understand your seat of where you're at. I know where you're coming from and your thoughts. So when I look at these things, um, 
I'm a real estate developer, which is why I'm here and I'm involved in this. So when I look at these bills, from my standpoint, when I'm a commissioner, I look at it from a very bilateral standpoint, from all points of view, from the left side, right side, upside down, whatever, and try to consider all things. And I've looked at this in every possible direction and tried to make a lot of sense of this, and I appreciate some of the comment, comments, but at the end of the day, on this, the, the more and more I looked into it, this was driven from a very, very, very small audience of people who had some objections to the way things are going to short-term rentals. Um, this property or this bill was drafted by a council person who is adamantly against short-term rentals in Nashville. There's no secret about that. Who also lives next to one, and I think has a, a challenge with them. So is looking to create something that just furthers the uh, restrictions that we have against short-term rental properties in Nashville. It to me seems like very much a a solution to a non-existent problem. It's just not there. Uh, there has never been in the history of Nashville some a member of the public come up here and speak in objection to, other than tonight, uh, the current rules that are written for the way parking is with short-term rental properties. So uh, as referenced with uh, one person speaking in support of the bill, and there's many behind to speak in opposition to this, I think that it's overwhelming the number, the, the way the public thinks about this particular bill. Um, so this is, to me, a compliance issue. Uh, that should be taken from that perspective. And I think that we should all look to look from a compliance standpoint, uh, if there are specific complaints, to contact the compliance department and perhaps, worst case scenario, add further staff for compliance. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Scott. Um, I'm here to talk to you about um, a property I own on 829 Lacey Ave. Um, a lot of things uh, that were brought up tonight I was going to go over, but I won't be um, repeating any of those. I think the most important example for why this bill should not be passed is all these three to four bedroom non-owner occupied short-term rentals will now be converted into long-term rental properties if this bill was to be passed, which means due to the high cost of living in Nashville and the lack of homes on the market, three to four people could be living in one unit or home each one of these 365-day long-term renters would need to, parking for their own car and any guests that would want to visit, such as significant others or family members. Even a couple with no children would take up two parking spaces on the street if there is no garage parking like most of the homes in the city. Um, this would cause more parking issues than tourists who fly into Nashville and utilize Uber, Lyft, and local taxi services. And that is one of the main reasons why I think this bill should not be passed. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Dotson. I'm the chairman of the Greater Nashville Realtors Legislative Committee and the incoming board member. Uh, we made a request to staff for me to speak longer because I'm speaking on behalf of the, of the organization. I'm gonna abbreviate my comments just to not repeat things. Um, First, let me say, we understand that short-term rentals can be disrupted with the character and civility of a neighborhood, even if it's peaceful all across Metro, but the house next door has a party going on, it, it's not okay, and, and, and we get that. The overwhelming majority of owners of short-term rentals are not BlackRock or Greystone. They're individuals who have invested in real estate and they're trying to secure the future for their families. This may be the only way that they can actually profit from and benefit from the crush of tourists that we're fortunate enough to have. Uh, I believe all of you at this point have our very cogent letter from Brian Copeland, the president of our organization that states our objections to this. These are the positions we've stood behind for years and for months on number 831. But by way of quick summary, this requirement is not consistent with parking requirements across Metro. By the time you get into usage tables, it's not one parking space per bedroom in a hotel. It's in conflict with NDOT's walkable city concept. The stormwater considerations are not considered and it reduces the opportunities for affordable housing. Our attorney advises this, that this is an overreach and the information that we get from the CVC says that somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% of users of short-term rentals are riding a rideshare service. They don't even park a car there. This is not an enforcement issue that's in the hands of Metro Police. This is in the hands of codes. The prevalent problem with that is nobody is at work at codes 
Monday through Friday after four or on Saturday and Sunday. The, prep, the, minor, the major problems that happen, happen after four o'clock, Monday through Friday and on Saturday and Sunday. We've always maintained that a tangible and concerted effort to address the enforcement of the fabulous regulations the Metro Council worked so hard to craft would really be a great step in the right direction. Councilmember O'Connell met with us finally last week, and he told us that this stems from he lives next door to one of these, and he's got a problem. So he's trying to do something to squash it. But this seems like a heavy-handed approach. It steps down hard across all of Metro, and this is just not the best solution. We met with him last week. We asked him to help let us come back with some proposals, and he insisted on going forward with this. So look, let me say this. We're all in the same boat. You can see the number of people that are standing here that don't agree with this. We'd like the opportunity to come back with some solutions. We've been trying for months. So if we could do that, that'd be great. We appreciate all your work on this. We'll be back in front of you. Hi, my name is Tom Kesey. I live at 1101 North 8th Street. Um, I also have an Airbnb and I've uh, for a while lived next door to two um, four bedroom Airbnbs. And so I'm uh, uniquely um, uh, have, have lived the situation. Uh, and um, so the four bedroom uh, Airbnbs that I lived uh, next to, um, there was never a parking problem. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of not understanding where this is coming from. I know this is probably more of a, sounds like a Germantown problem than uh, a problem that we had in our neighborhood. Um, so then my, another question is, is like, why are we doing this across all districts or why are we fixing one, um, taking a solution in one area and trying to put it across all areas? Uh, then number two is, um, I'm looking at it from a property value standpoint. When the Airbnb is taken away from these um, units, um, either they'll build more Airbnb and take away retail, uh, which hurts employment, um, and um, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Brown. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Uh, I actually live in Mount Juliet. I was a Wilson County Commissioner there, so I appreciate also what you're dealing with here. I know it's not easy. There's lots of facets that go to this. I'm going to speak to one of the more minor things. There's a lot of reasons that this is being rushed and not looked at, but as a uh, real estate firm owner at 2828 uh, Elm Hill Pike, Suite 110, uh, we're a small firm, about 50 agents, but we represent builders developers all over Nashville and uh, Davidson County. One of the issues that we're dealing with a lot with our builders is the lack of porous uh, ground, the runoff issue. It comes up all the time. Uh, this is going to take a long time to be able to see what the effects of that are going to be just on little places where we're taking a house that didn't have a lot of parking and that kind of thing and the sidewalks that are coming in. It, it takes a lot of time to get through all of that. To do something like this that, that offers a small amount of help, I guess, to a, a, a small district to put this over an entire county seems kind of kind of wild. So I would uh, I'd take a really hard look at what that's going to do to the water off and how that's going to affect the neighbors around it. Uh, then the last point is when we talk about a hotel room that may have two queen beds and a pull-out couch, that's generally a family. Um, so it's really like a three bedroom. Um, when a family rents a short term like that, it could be a family of five or six in one car. So to attack it and say that it's just like a hotel doesn't seem relevant either. So thank you guys for your time. Uh, good evening, commissioners. DJ Wilson, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Titus Young, real estate. Um, if I can piggyback pretty much off his comment to speak what he said, I, I think we will all agree that hotels they do rent by room, but Airbnb, four bedroom Airbnbs don't rent by the room. So trying to attack the problem that way, I don't think would be judicious in that route. But uh, to speak for my own personal self as a developer, um, <clears throat> I just closed on a $7 million loan to do a development, 18 units, 
all pretty much going to be Airbnb. All has parking, two car garages, doesn't interrupt the neighborhood, zoned MUL. Everything checks all the boxes. Entire Airbnb development. This rule comes in and says, wait a minute, we can't do that. Probably come first of the year. $7 million on the hook. So I'm speaking from the business perspective on one end, but also a logic perspective on, on the other end. Um, I don't think that um, I've heard of any complaints in regards to parking, in regards to Airbnbs, uh, and I've sold a number of them, and I have friends who manage some of the ones that I've sold uh, with regard to that. <clears throat> and so when we talk about parking, I think most people in here know that people that come in town, they rent cars, they do ride share, they're in and out in, in a couple of days. So likening Airbnb uh, to individual hotel stays, um, I don't think is judicious in this matter. So that's my piece. Good evening, I'm Deborah Volley. I'm at 2445 East Land Avenue, District 6. Um, I'm here in opposition to this bill as it's written, um, but mostly I'm opposed because of the lack of evidence for its need, as everyone has said. Um, other than anecdotal reasons, um, when you consider the facts, we, the bill is just not necessary. And most short-term rental guests, again, are using ride shares, but I'll just give you one more fact, is that fewer than 15 complaints have been made over the past two years for non-owner-occupied short-term rentals in Nashville with the host compliance line. So again, not sure why we're even here. Um, the bill will have huge repercussions throughout the city with the stormwater implications and um, you know, non-owner occupied, it's already not allowed in residential areas. So again, fewer than 15 complaints over the last two years. The evidence is not there. No study has been conducted when this will have huge repercussions. There's been no parking study done. And um, please just at least require more evidence of the need or allow us to come to you with some solutions or you know, not me personally, obviously, but someone who you can trust. And um, just know that these short-term rentals are supporting a lot of local small businesses. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name's Henry Puckett. I'm a resident of Hendersonville, Tennessee but I'm a community association manager with Gertner & Company, the largest management company in Middle Tennessee, okay? Uh, we do not own and operate short-term rentals, nor, but we do manage the complexes these short-term rental, short rentals are located in. It is from our perspective that I can tell you that we don't have, we almost have no complaints about short-term rental parking, okay? From our clients, uh, in, short, in fact, with great confidence, I can tell you we receive more parking complaints for long-term rental clients than we do short-term rentals. Short-term rentals are in and out, okay? Part of my prior experience is in hospitality, and I can share with you, you're going to hear several percentages, but it's always over 50%. And different data studies show, the data, data that I have is that 60% of your short-term rental, your transient lodging people that come in here use Lyft or other transportation to come in here. They don't use their own cars and they don't drive into town, okay? So, you know, the parking issue, I'm not sure where that's coming from. And we're concerned that this measure that asserts itself so badly does not take in consideration of the impact on your complexes and our clients. We are left to deal with the aftermath of such a such an approval and have to deal with a process that confuses and angers most people. So we would ask you to, to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Gomez. I live in Thompson Station, but I own eight properties in Davidson County. Some of them are short-term rentals, some of them are not. Um, it, I just feel, uh, first of all, I appreciate what you all do. This is a very hard job. I do feel sometimes when uh, a bill comes up for short-term rentals, it's very, uh, there's this a lot of lack of evidence. There's just no, uh, like somebody said, hey, there's a, a parking problem, but then there's nothing to like actually support it. So I would love to be able to see uh, more evidence on really the, the you know, the impact that, it, negative impact that, that it, you know, they're speaking about. Um, and I also invite you to go drive around on Monday mornings in different short-term rental complex. You're gonna see all the bachelorettes waiting for the Ubers and the Lyft, and it's like nonstop. So like, 
not many people really drive uh, over here when they come from, uh, you know, to, to spend the weekend here in Nashville. So um, I also urge you to consider that this would affect negatively so many people that own short-term rentals that are really good, great operators, and also the people like the property managers, the the cleaning companies. Um, so you will be affecting a lot of people uh, in a negative way um, when we're all trying to like just thrive and and be able to take a part of the wonderful uh, tourism growth that we're having, pay our first share of taxes. So um, we just always encourage uh, really good open conversation, and you know we're and most of us are always willing to sit down and help and try to figure things out because we know that it's a disruptive industry, absolutely. Uh, but we also know that talking, we were, you know, we can come up to some, some really good solutions where there's like a, a, a middle of the road type of situation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is Rachel Mays and I live at 1400 Roselle Parks Boulevard in uh, District 19. And I'm a realtor, and uh, I specialize in the, the STR community, uh, STR investors, and represent a good number of them. Um, and they um, kind of uh, echoing what another gentleman said earlier. <clears throat> I mean, if they are not able to renew their permits, they will have to uh, go to long term. And and just as someone mentioned, you know, that's that's a much greater chance that. And four bedroom homes, there's going to be multiple people with a you know with a vehicle, and a lot of these garages sit empty uh, as they're currently operating as STRs. Um, and then the cost of the hotels, too. I mean, like, the, the all of the STR property is what supports the tourism industry here and all of the people coming here and, um, and choosing to stay in more affordable short-term rentals as opposed to the hotel rooms that are five and $600 a night. So it would be um, far damaging across multiple industries and uh, and sectors of our economy that we're blessed to have. And um, and I want to also thank you. I was a city planner in, uh, on the commission in, in New Orleans. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's it's hard what you do to hear all this opposition and, and different ideas being thrown around out there. But please hear us and um, at least work with us to try to come up with a better solution. Thank you. How you doing? Eric Brazier, 318 Bond Street. Um, again here, just coming up to defend a, a project that I diligently put together following all the current guidelines, codes, laws, and ordinances. Fortunately, all the other bills and council members that wrote up the previous bills with short-term rentals understood that it would be inappropriate to move the goalposts in the middle of a project and were willing to listen to owners and builders about the impact and changing the rules midway through. Uh, I applaud them for remaining focused in their cause, yet willing to listen and make considerations if the project had already started. This bill had not allowed for any such discussions. This bill has not por put forth any effort of resources to complete studies of due diligence that are required by all owners and builders for every project they start. While understanding the merit of the bill, shouldn't it, shouldn't it require some studies to show the impact of current parking situation? Shouldn't it requ be required to show how many constituents would be affected? how they'd be affected, how many projects are in process that would be affected, and what the total financial hit would be by all of these. To start any project here in Nashville, there's a massive list of requirements that owners and builders must complete to paint a fact-based case that illustrates how and why a project is compliant with zoning, code, stormwater, water, sewer, NES, fire marshal, public works, traffic, and any type of voter lease it may be in. Yet in this instance, an overbearing and wide cast bill could be drawn up with no supporting documentation or current impact cause and effect. This type of contrast between the requirements seems unfair and biased and is somewhat disheartening to all of us that, that really wanna do things the right way. So I just request that when these are presented that there could be an opportunity for grandfathering for any projects that are halfway through on its way or at some certain stage that could act as, a, uh, as just a marker just to know that we've, we've already invested into this, we've already started it and to move the goal points at this point is just uh, detrimental. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nina Lampley. I'm a national native. Um, I'm a realtor for the last 15 years, and I'm also part owner with Eric, who just spoke um, at the property that was formerly 829 Lishy Avenue. Um, we put forth three years of effort into building out this project, um, working with the neighborhood and the council persons, and working within what we were obligated to do within Metro and our guidelines were currently zoned CS zoning. So we had to no, do no rezoning. Um, we built eight townhomes. They have one and two car garages. Had we been 
provided with this information, we obviously would have built the buildings accordingly. So at this time, we're in a bind um, because we built them according to what Metro has approved and we have six units remaining to close that um, if this goes into effect by January 1, then those people cannot obtain short-term rental permits. Um, at this time, Metro is taking 40 to 50 days um, to issue permits, so that creates an impossibility of that those things to happen. Um, this creates a hardship for many of us, and I'm hoping that there's understanding here of the risk we've all taken, all while following the rules, regulations of Metro, and it's just really unfair to us to change the rules that we followed from the beginning. I'm just asking that we come up with a better solution. Thank you. My name is Staria Clark. I live at 233 Chapel in East Nashville. I'm a realtor and I work with homeowners and developers. I also own an Airbnb myself. This bill would affect me and many of my clients directly. It would affect the income that we rely on. We've made financial decisions based on the ability to do short-term rentals on these properties. I have seen no reason or justification for this bill. I've seen no issues with parking myself or with any of my clients. There are no studies or proof that there are any parking problems that this bill would solve. I see this as an unjustified way to simply try to reduce the number of short-term rentals in Nashville, and I ask that you vote no. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Grant Hammond, 342 Harrison Street in Councilman O'Connell's district. I just want to start by pointing out the obvious. Uh, at this public meeting, there is one person speaking uh, for this proposal and looks like more than 40 against. Um, let's state the obvious again. Historic Germantown has a parking problem. Uh, and it's been around for seven years. The HOA president uh, just acknowledged that there are 20 restaurants that provide virtually no parking in that district. One can make the argument, having looked at parking on non-owner-occupied short-term rentals, that they actually reduce the parking requirement for street parking due to the use of rideshare apps. No one can prove that, however, because there is no parking study. To make a law that will affect the entire county based on one unique situation in historic Germantown doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. The other thing that doesn't make a lot of sense to me is this notion that this is bringing this in line with hotel parking. It's untrue. Um, there are three developments that are in Councilman Connell's district, one on Reverend Enoch, one at Nashville Brick, that are permitted as hotels. They are built as townhome structures, but they are built to a hotel standard. They are required to have one parking space per front door. This is the same for hotels. If a hotel suite has four bedrooms behind the hotel door, it's one parking requirement. So we do have an actual over parking if you want to compare directly to hotel standards. If that comes as news to you, it probably comes to news to a lot of us, uh, but having studied it now and having talked to Councilman O'Connell about it, who continues to state uh, something that is not true, um, it, uh, it distresses me. I don't feel like this bill has risen to the level where it's ready to have this particular body vote on it. I'd really like to see the councilman do more work on it, bring it back, and have this professional institution have a more substantial bill to vote on. Please vote no. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Brown. I live in Old Hickory. Um, my issue with this, uh, not only with Airbnbs, is also with parking minimums. Um, themselves. Um, a mobile workforce needs housing options beyond long leases, but these regulations stand in the way of what short-term rentals offer. Uh, this kind of housing is no longer just for tourists. Studies show it is now needed and used by workers who require temporary housing for too short a time to sign a six to 12 month lease. And this represents an emerging sector of workforce housing. Uh, according to the CEO of Airbnb, 25% of rentals were for a minimum of 28 days and not used for tourism, and 50% of nights booked were from stays of at least one week. Uh, this is further evidence that STR is an emerging housing market. Uh, other STR customer demographics include low-income renters who can't sign long-term leases due to credit checks or inability to afford deposits. Among others are college students who can't afford campus housing, temp workers who are in a city for a few months, such as traveling nurses. Uh, the intent of these regulations was to stop unruly tourists from disturbing neighborhoods, which we can all agree is a problem that requires attention. However, this creates a market that only caters to middle and upper class customers who can afford the rates of unnatural market manipulation. 
Uh, empirical evidence overwhelmingly shows how parking minimums contribute to poor fiscal efficiency and environmental problems. Uh, when the cost of lost tax revenue is calculated across major cities where parking minimums are required by law for most properties, there's a massive loss in, in tax value. Area, entire areas of town will be effectively excluded from offering SDRs to the previously mentioned demographics, and this doesn't just include suburban neighborhoods, as it's obvious that more parking constraints are held in urban sectors where numerous other setback and building requirements are implemented. Parking minimums are the sole contributor to massive asphalt deserts that create ugly environments and attract crime due to the greater distance between homes and businesses. And in the modern age of climate awareness, why are we still forcing the car to be the most valued part of this society? Um, in addition to cumulative loss and property tax basis that directly results from enforcing these minimums, it also pigeonholes new construction that allocates the majority of its land to asphalt parking lots. Thank you. Well, guys, thanks for having us. Um, I'm sure you guys are getting tired of it by now, um, but this is a really big deal to a lot of the people. Um, uh, the reason I'm here is because my wife, uh, she has six of these. Uh, she was a dental hygienist, and uh, her sand started hurting, um, carpal tunnel syndrome, wasn't able to do it, uh, wanted to be a realtor, tried to be a realtor, did that, but um, didn't love it. Um, it's a lot of peopling. It's for introverts, that's really tough. Um, she was able to find Airbnb, changed her whole life. Um, she absolutely loves it. Uh, she runs six of them in the city. Uh, they're all six successful. Um, she's done much better financially. I can't tell you how many guests tell her how much she loves it. Um, I know this would impact quite a few of the properties. Obviously, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that would be lost. I believe the grant, when I looked, it was 1650 I'm a real estate agent. Every single one of those would probably lose 75 grand in value. I don't know how much that affects the taxes or what the government would get, but obviously that money would go down. So, at a, and then if you bought it, you paid 75,000 more, right? So that you could use it as a business that you now won't even be able to do, and then you were forced to sell it. Obviously, that's going to be a huge loss. So many of these people are small business owners. Um, that's how she makes her living. Uh, I do real estate, and that's how I make mine. Uh, it affects my clients. It affects so many people. I hate that we have to be here for this. I really do, because there's just not a justification. Parking is not an issue. Never has been. They don't do cars. I've lived in Airbnbs before. Um, no parking. Like, you just don't see people park there. So I hope you guys will take this into consideration. Um, I appreciate your, your time and uh, look forward to your result. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sean Cavanaugh. I live in Wilson County, uh, but I do own an Airbnb on 162 Fourth Avenue North. I just um, want to kind of recap on <clears throat> the spirit of Nashville originally with all the nearly 40 bills that have been passed is to get the hotels out of neighborhoods. So that's happening. Uh, everything's commercially zoned now for not owner occupied residential become less and less. We're aware of the RM zone property that fades out in 2022. So parking in commercial districts, I don't think is a problem or outside of some of the fascinating data I've heard today with uh, Germantown, 12 South also brings that up as well. I don't see any extreme parking rules and regulations there when it comes to short-term rentals or, or the restaurants that are causing the real issues. So uh, with this in the background of this bill, I thought it was interesting that while they had bullet points of the success of owner occupied being acceptable within neighborhoods. What they simply just seemingly passed over was varying effects of commercially zoned or non owner occupied properties. I thought there'd be more data points to that and, and some of the struggles outside of a one story incident and varying events. I don't think this bill certainly solves anything for the future. As I just mentioned, we have grandfathered clauses and RM properties and only commercial developments left for people to be able to park and enjoy and invest as small business owners in the city. Thank you. Hello there. My name is Robert Mulcahy. I'm actually uh, relatively new to Nashville, but come here as someone who cares deeply about my community and participated deeply in the civic society of my hometown in Baltimore. Um, 
I just have two points to emphasize. First, again, as has been stated already, uh, this bill seeks to solve an issue, it seems, that, that doesn't appear to exist. Um, and therefore, it's my second point. It seems that, that if this bill is implemented, it would actually add more parking to the urban core uh, without any support for um, why that additional parking would be to the community's benefit. Um, in fact, there's good reason to suggest that the effects of this bill would be detrimental to the character of these neighborhoods. More parking means more car traffic, more congestion, less walkability, less green space, a greater burden on stormwater infrastructure, the potential for the creation of parking lot deserts, and a deterioration of the neighborhood feel. Um, that seems like a step in the wrong direction to me, particularly in light of this commission's long-term transit goals. Thank you for your time. Hey guys, uh, Matt Hoyles from 229 Chapel Avenue. Um, thanks, for, thanks for tonight. Um, at risk of um, repeating a lot of the stuff that's already been said uh, around you know, developers who are mid-construction on an STR project, uh, current owners of STRs, um, and just the future of SDRs in the city. You know, there's a lot at risk financially, um, and you know, as Rob mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of those other factors. Really important to consider. But tonight, I'll speak about my experience as an Airbnb uh, owner and investor. Uh, I've been a uh, short-term rental investor for nine years uh, on one property alone. Probably had over a thousand stays um, since I started hosting. Um, and I have cameras on the property, I have parking on the site, and so I know how many um, tenants are coming, but more importantly, related to this bill, um, how they come. Um, and it has been my experience over the last nine years, over a thousand stays, that the vast majority of folks come um, and they use rideshare. Um, I have a four bedroom, um, non-owner occupied um, site, and they are literally, you know, coming by rideshare and leaving by ride chair. So it just seems like the, you know, that this bill is, hasn't really been well thought through. Um, it seems to be an attempt just to kind of limit short-term rentals around town. Um, and I just think that um, without any empirical studies or reports that suggest that short-term rental non-owner occupied are causing a parking issue, it just seems like a pretty widespread bill to pass um, without any real considered thought behind it. But thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the result. Hello everyone, my name is Michael. I live in District 4. Um, I'm a general contractor. If this passes, my two anchor projects going into 2022 are done, not going to go forward. Um, if you go to Metro Codes right now to try to get from the start to the finish to be able to get building permits, you're looking at eight to ten months. So it's going to affect me, my family, all the subcontractors that I pay that are already lined up to start this project projects. We've already bought materials because of supply shortages. They're going to be out that money. I'm going to be out time and money. And yeah, you know, that's basically what's going, to, what's going to happen to me and my little small construction company if this bill passes. Thanks. Good evening and thank you for being here. My name is Rebecca Cooper. Um, I live at 1428 Benjamin Street in District 6. Um, <clears throat> I categorically oppose the proposed restriction on non-owner occupied STRs that would require a parking space for each bedroom. Without empirical evidence that non-owner occupied STRs are the root cause of the parking stress in zones that allow them, or even that there is actually parking stress that could be quantified and proven, it would seem that any decision to apply an arbitrary restriction on a poorly analyzed or understood problem is not only spurious, but foolhardy, potentially detrimental to a revenue stream for property owners and tax revenues for this city. Um, and then everything that everybody else said, I had all that in here, everything. Um, <laughs> again, I have no empirical data that can yield insight into causation of parking pressures in certain areas, so I would hope you wouldn't take any action based on my musings on a problem, uh, parking problems and solutions. Um, and uh, yeah, so all that as a property owner and a citizen of District 6, I respectfully request that you do not pass this amendment. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tom McCormick. I live at 1209 Saxon Drive. Um, I believe that the facts do not support this uh, bill. I mean, it, 
it's basically, as someone else said, it's a, it's a solution trying to find a problem. Um, someone else, I think, brought this up, but there was, and I did a little research myself just to quantify the information, but there was only 15 Airbnb parking complaints in the last two years. And a majority of those complaints were related to uh, blocking a, a driveway or blocking a, a, a mailbox, temporary. Um, I've not seen any evidence of any studies that support this uh, concept that uh, there's a parking problem with short-term rental. Um, to me, it's just, it's just anecdotal related to not liking short-term rental. Um, and I think someone else brought it up too that to my knowledge, not a single person uh, that has spoke at a public meeting has ever brought up any concern over parking with short-term rental. So again, I think this is just a, 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 prob, a, a solution looking for a problem. My experience with short-term rental has been that a majority of people who, who do short-term rental do not drive. They use ride share of some sort. And I think there's, there's uh, strong evidence supporting probably, I don't know, 60% or more of those people do not drive cars. Um, so in my, my opinion, the facts do not support this bill, and I ask you to vote against it. Good evening. My name is Chris Barnheiser, and I'm a builder and developer here in Nashville. Um, I've built several complexes that would be affected by this bill. Um, the first complex that we built is roughly five years ago, and it was a 12-unit complex. All four-bedroom townhomes, all had two-car garages. Uh, in a partnership, we've kept this project and have had zero parking issues whatsoever. Um, we actually end up using uh, for laundry storage and for trash storage a few of the garage bays because they truly never get used. Um, like everybody else has said, I think this is a problem trying to, a, a, a problem, a solution trying to find a problem. Um, I don't see any true basis to this. Um, it's 2021 and we're talking about adding parking into the urban core. It goes against everything that all of us are working on and everyone's working on. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, we do a lot with corporate rental. Um, that's a good portion of our tenants now. Um, that really uh, is majority of your week. Um, with all the new job announcements coming to Nashville um, and having a lot of the, uh, the larger companies from California, a lot of the tech companies that we've worked with, they really like the, the culture of having their people being able to co-live and co-work when they're coming here and moving here. Um, and this, this really, they're not going to be bringing their cars and they're not, they're moving from cities that are used to ha having walkability and having the ability to not be in a car, but to be able to use ride share. Um, so there are just so many things that are, that it affects a lot of, um, what I really hear a lot with, uh, whenever there's negativity towards development, it's that it's this large conglomerate of massive corporations that are doing these things and simply not true. It's a lot of small businesses that'll be affected and, uh, just doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Ryan Adcock. I'm a Nashville resident at 1213 uh, Kenwood Drive in Inglewood. I will confirm what was uh, spoken about earlier. Uh, I took my dog on a walk last night and saw one deer and zero humans. So just want to make sure that that's on the record. But I'm also the Government Affairs Director for Greater Nashville Realtors, more importantly to this conversation. Um, generally speaking, this bill seems to uh, seek out yet another way to prevent new short-term rentals from coming into the market and squeezing out existing short-term rentals as they change ownership down the road. Parking isn't and hasn't been the story when someone has a complaint about an STR. A lack of enforcement of existing policies seems to be the root cause of all the hot takes on local news coverage. Adding even more unenforced and unenforceable regulations like this isn't the solution for what seems to be a small, hyper-local, neighborhood-specific problem, which is looking for a countywide mandate as a solution. Constantly changing the rules on existing and future owners creates frustration and confusion for all parties involved. 
This lack of consistency in a constantly changing playing field has already helped to deteriorate, deteriorate this industry. And can we not just stick to enforcing the rules and laws on the books as opposed to introducing a new mechanism to choke them out even more in the future? And at the very least, can we not all just admit that on the front end, this is actually what this type of legislation seems to be doing? If we had a clearer picture at the beginning of everyone's real goals, maybe we could help address problems easier in the future rather than finding a new parking regulation, a fire escape rule, or whatever will end up being the next minor change filed bill with the exact same goal of choking out this industry in Nashville that provides a service to abundant visitors, numerous income to numerous Nashville residents and tax revenue to local government programs, namely the Barnes Fund, which will be the first program to take a financial hit in order for this, if this is uh, to pass. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. I've given you a two year break from me. All right, so it's good to see you, Councilman, um, but you know, I always have to say this, no outbursts. We keep the meetings professional. Please try not to clap. I appreciate that. Um, we've missed you, Councilman. Uh, it's been two years, I think, since you've been here. And so welcome. Thank you for coming. Well, as always, you guys are working very hard. It's a pleased to see my two wonderful colleagues. Um, they work extremely hard. The constituents blow up their phones constantly. And I sympathize with the sponsor of this bill. Um, we were in Camp Obama together. Even then, when he was a young neighborhood activist, um, they'd blow up his phone about basic things, dog barking. This is before council. And I want to thank the staff for being here, working so diligently on the rezoning. And we can't thank you enough or pay you enough. And thank you, commissioners, for volunteering all these hundreds of hours for nothing. Saying that, let's talk about parking. I uh, live in the 5th District. I'm a former council person. Two of my constituents are here. I think a third one is back there, former. And yes, short-term rentals are a problem. They throw these wild parties sometimes. But there was a wild party a couple weeks ago. We were taking photos of it. And they did not have a legal permit with the city. And second, when the police showed up to break up the party, did you think everyone jumped in a bunch of cars? No. About, about 15, 20 minutes, and it was surge time during the Uber or ride share times, and about 20 Lyfts and Ubers showed up, and all these young folks you know, jumped in these cars, three and four and five. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but you remember when we were kids and the clowns would all come out in the little small car? That's what it looked like. <laughs> Listen, the parking is not the issue. Enforcement, enforcement. We've been beating this drum. I know my two colleagues over here were beating this drum. Everybody's been beating this drum enforcement somehow. And that's it. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming. Um, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none and the councilman is not here, we declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Blackshear, you want to go first? Okay. Am I good? Good. All right. So we've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence, conflicting anecdotal evidence about the need for the bill. Surely there are neighborhoods who are um, impacted by parking. We've heard from folks who say there's no issue with their particular Airbnbs, maybe in different areas. Maybe parking is being exaggerated in certain areas because of other uses, not Airbnb. So is there any type of data set that you find reliable to kind of give us a starting point to assess, assess the need for this law? Lisa, I think it would be helpful just to talk through the evolution of how STRs have been classified, because I think it's not so much of an issue of having data about a specific problem, but more of a classification issue in the code, which is creating um, perhaps a lack of clarity at the codes department, which we're being asked to address. Is that, Lisa, can you address that? Sure. Um, so the, um, the 
the first time that short-term rentals sort of appeared in our zoning code was in 2014. Um, and that was when short-term rental property was added to the zoning code as an accessory use to uh, within districts that specified, uh, that allowed residential uses. And so it was uh, established as an, as, as an accessory use to residential uses. Um, and so because it was an accessory use, there was no separate parking requirements. And, and so that everyone sort of understands the way that short-term rental permits work is it's a use permit. So I would never go to the building and to the codes department and apply to build a short-term rental. I would go to the codes department to apply to build a single family home or a duplex or a multifamily complex. But you don't go in and you don't get permits for the construction of a short-term rental. So a short-term rental is a use permit. It happens at the end of the process when after you get a use and occupancy permit. And so uh, that's just about how the permits work and how these sort of have a different type of permit issuance. Um, so short-term rentals added in 2014. Um, there have been, uh, the standards started out in Title VI of the code and then they were transferred to Title 17 of the code and now they're back in Title VI of the code in relation to operational standards. Um, short-term rentals were ultimately uh, split into two uses. Owner-occupied short-term rentals and not owner-occupied short-term rentals. And this was with Bill, with 608, which is sort of the, the countywide governing document now. So when they were divided into owner-occupied short-term rentals and not owner-occupied short-term rentals, owner-occupied is classified as a residential use, um, sort of accessory to other residential uses. I mean, it's under the residential category classification. Not owner-occupied short-term rentals was then classified as a commercial use. So owner-occupied is essentially a accessory use still to either a single family, two family, or multifamily use. Not owner-occupied became a commercial use, but when it was created as a commercial use, it did not have any standards that were set up for parking. Um, so there is no necessarily parking requirement when you're coming in to get an essential a commercial um, use permit. Um, and so the codes department now, there's no standard. It's somewhat ambiguous. And so we saw this as an opportunity to clarify standards and to um, present a similar standard to what is utilized for a bed and breakfast use or hotels where it's one per room. Okay. That helps. So we did hear um, a person in opposition talk about the standards that are applied to hotels and had the example of a suite, a hotel suite. So you could have multiple rooms within a hotel suite, but that the standard would be for parking would be one car per door. I mean, is that from... So, yeah, and let me speak to that a little bit. I think there was the, the, there was the comment of, well, you could have a hotel room that had two queen-size beds and you would still only have to have one parking space. Well, you could have a bedroom and a short-term rental that could have two queen-size beds and that would require one parking space, and so it is similar. Um, I think he was speaking of, like, multi-room hotel suites. Yes, that would still only require one parking space per hotel, um, per, per the parking code. So it's one per bedroom or rooming unit. Okay, and so I'm just trying to make sure that I'm understanding the status analysis. So the hotel suite analogy, which obviously he was trying to compare the Airbnb to, that to you was not a fair analogy as far as the parking requirement because of evidence that you've seen or just, just the general idea of a hotel and an Airbnb being the... You have a lot of control. Who <laughs> gets to talk? <laughs> um, we were looking at this strictly as bringing the standard into the same land use category classification. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can look at how we define parking for hotels. Yeah. I mean, we talk about suites. It's the same thing here. But the code changed several years ago and classifies these as commercial uses. But the department is 
the codes department is still issuing these as residential because there are no other standards. And so that's, and so there's some um, ambiguity there um, between the standards that are applied for parking and what's actually in the zoning code. And so um, that, that was the approach um, that we took. So is the, I'm just sorry, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what's going on. So the standard that is being proposed to be set for the Airbnbs is not based upon any um, evidence for a need for it other than just wanting to be technically correct and making sure that a commercial use has what is considered a commercial parking standard. Sure. So it is essentially to define a parking standard. There is no parking standard yeah. right now for not owner occupied short term rentals. And so it is to define a parking standard for a commercial use, um, which is not unusual um, in the code. And so it is to define it um, to define a parking standard for a commercial use um, with a similar standard to similar like uses, hotels, air, um, bed and breakfast. Um, it may not be exactly transmittable if you think about a large suite in a hotel, but these are very similar uses and this is a similar standard. I got you. So um, we've heard, in addition to maybe there being um, conflicting ideas about the need for this ordinance, we've heard obviously a lot of people talking about their particular properties and the ability to grandfather, and obviously that's something we have discussed before. We're talking about SCRs, and could you guys talk about, I guess, that a little bit? Sure. So for permits that are existing, those permits are existing and they would not be required to meet the standard. Um, this would be applicable to new permits. Um, it also... Um, would not apply to the um, renewal of a permit. Um, if ownership changes, um, and this is, this is um, common now, if ownership changes, then you have to come into compliance with any new regulations. I mean, this is per the state regulations that were adopted related to short-term rentals. Um, and so if there is an existing permit, then they do not have to come into compliance with this new regulation. If that permit is renewed, it would not have to come into compliance. Um, it would be for new permits. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to explain to me how the short-term use permitting process works. And so we, we heard um, from a few people who have begun constructing what they intend to use as short-term rental so that, and they won't be able to get the short-term rental permit until that construction is completed. And so for those people, if this law passes as written, they would not, they would not be able to, um, I guess, accept themselves from this law. Is that right? That's correct. So if a project, if a residential project, because that's what they've gotten a permit for, if a residential project is under construction um, and it has parking standards that meet the residential parking standards, which is probably how the permit was issued, then it could be a residential use. But if it did not meet the parking standards for a commercial use, if they came in to get a commercial use permit, then it, then they would have to meet those standards. Okay. Um, that was really helpful. I am certainly still considering this, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other commissioners' um, discussions. Yeah, I have a clarification. I, I need a moment. Okay. Um, we, we actually are being asked for two different decisions, and are these two decisions dependent, or can they be independent of each other? We're being asked to amend both Section 6 and Section 7 with an and in it, but I didn't know if that was dependent. We only on make, our recommendation is just to approve the changes to Title 17. You all, as a body, don't make recommendations to other titles of the code. So it says to amend, his request is to amend the definition and the parking. So I have no trouble with the definition. I do have some trouble with amending the parking and so I didn't know if we could make those as two different decisions or if that's just one. Typically, the way that it would work is if you were to recommend approval of one and disapproval of the other, the entire bill would have a recommendation of disapproval for the purposes of council voting. And so there are actually three parts to this bill. There are changes to Title VI, which you all don't opine on. 
there are changes to the definition to add, to delete the word residential, which was likely left over and should have been removed whenever it became a commercial use. And then there's the parking. So we have, we as staff had ref, have recommended approval to both of the changes to Title 17. If you were, if you all were to vote one way on one and one, it would still for the purposes of council vote be a disapproval. Because I do think cleaning up the definitions is important but I also am concerned about making such significant changes to the parking without real data. I mean, I, I'm a trained researcher, so not having hard data to say, is this gonna fix the problem? Is there any causation here is troublesome to me. Um, I also think that it's really important to have community input. Uh, they probably, if we decide we do need to change this, then there's probably lots of good ideas sitting back there that we're not tapping into. So um, like our, my commissioner here, I would like to keep listening, but um, yes, I have okay with one part and, okay, and not with the other, so. Commissioner Handel. Let's see. All right, there we go, we're good. Uh, well, first I think um, Council Member O'Connell definitely swatted the hornet's nest with this one, uh, but as always, I'm, I'm great, grateful and thankful for all the people who came to speak. Um, taking time out of your day and, and, and to hear us deliberate about it now. Um, I, I do agree with my, some of my other, the previous council commissioner members who have spoken um, in stating that it does seem to be something that just needs a lot more study, a lot more engagement. Um, I mean, having been in, in different communities and, and being heavily involved in the community engagement space, um, you know, not maybe not represented here, but the public definitely does have some challenges with um, short-term rentals, and fortunately and hopefully, and what it sounds like, none of those people here in the room. Uh, but I do know that there is a, a, a people in the community that do deal with some of the parking challenges that happen when um, there may be some folks who are coming from more local and regional locations, and they do um, block the streets or, or absorb a lot of the street parking that would be traditionally for residents. So I think, I just, I just don't want it to go without being stated that that is a problem. I mean, you know, where there's smoke, there is fire. Um, it may not be abundant, and I, I will state clearly, I don't, I don't think that this is the solution for it. Um, I do think that enforcement is something that we've been um, shouting for and echoing for for a long time. Um, but a, a couple of the things I think are, are important to address is that, you know, when I read through this, the first thing that jumped out at me is not necessarily the language and change, and I agree with taking residential. It was just the fact that it would be enacted in five days um, from when it passes. I mean, to me, it just seems absurd. Um, again, we've talked about people who are here have mentioned that how that's, it just doesn't give you time for a business case to even respond and react to that. I think that's just unfortunate in terms of how aggressive the timeline is. Um, but I do think that, you know, again, there's probably some other solutions, something that can be done. I think a lot of communities have been responding to parking challenges, not just from short-term rentals, but now more so um, construction in neighborhoods. And, you know, they, the, the community, the neighborhood organizations, they find ways, whether it's cones or signs or whatever it is, um, and they speak with whoever is in charge of those projects, and then they, they, they work out some type of community-based self-policing of it, and I think that's really where our solution goes. And then there's another layer that is related to, you know, enforcement that's more severe. Um, that should be um, tied to whoever is the owner, manager, um, holder of the short-term permit. But I don't, I don't think this is the solution. Um, I think that's kind of evident by how many people um, showed up today to show how disruptive it could be. And I, I agree with a lot of the comments. And I do think if we're going to have something before us, there does need to be um, more substantial evidence in terms of what, what we're trying to solve. Um, it feels a little bit like the Walmart model now. You build so much parking for maybe the four events or less a year when you'll have those types of um, instances that may show up at some or a few um, Airbnb or short-term rental locations. That's thank it. you, Commissioner. Count, Councilman? Uh, thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. Um, I Appreciate Councilman McConnell bringing this ordinance um, so that we can have a discussion about it. Um, you know, the thing about uh, short-term rentals, the last time I, I kind of spoke and kind of had a lot of various things to say about short-term rentals uh, as my first uh, session as a planning commissioner uh, to talk about it. And, and uh, I think over time, if we continue to have legislation about short-term rentals, I'm going to revisit some of those things that I just really just wanted to get on the table uh, last time to continue to remind you folks of. But one thing um, 
uh, about short-term rentals uh, is that um, the a non-owner occupied short-term rental and an owner occupied short-term rental when the owner is absent are not fundamentally different. So you can have an owner occupied short-term rental where the owner is not present. Maybe they're just, I've had neighbors who just went away for a vacation for a, a week. And during that time, their guests caused all kinds of havoc in the community and they were horrified. But the, the issues that do happen when you do have a, a problematic STR are not, uh, limited to one category or the other. I think in many respects, they behave more similarly than a lot of folks would imagine. And I'm saying this as from a neighborhood standpoint. Um, and so I, I, I wanna put that out there. I mean, I, I can see sort of a, a legal argument for saying this one particular classification should have a different parking standard than another. On the other hand, we have lots of uh, officially owner-occupied short-term rentals where the owner is never present. We have some where the neighbors in the codes department believe that no owner is ever present at all and that it's challenging to prove that someone lives there at all, um, right? And so, so what I feel like this does is this actually exacerbates that sort of divide where some folks are likely going to uh, kind of take advantage of, well, I can change my driver's license and get a utility bill and say that I live there <laughs> in order to get an owner-occupied permit when they don't, right? And so I think this sort of exacerbates that problem. And I think that at some level, this is fundamentally bad planning um, because for those who do comply, what you will get is that you will have buildings with very, very large parking garages or very large garages, parking garages or parking decks or parking lots, particularly in urban areas, which is not where we want those things to be. Um, I, I think this is fundamentally bad planning. Um, I think that the comparison to, um, even I would say with um, historic bed and breakfast, the one thing that's different about a historic bed and breakfast is that uh, each room is a separate contract. And so it's not typically that a family of five is gonna rent a historic bed and breakfast that has three bedrooms. Now that could happen. But they also have a different permitting system where each bed room is a separate contract. And so it's more likely that in that smaller building, you would have three cars for three rooms than it is with a family or a group that's coming in all to stay together in one building. Um, so I, I don't know that that's a good comparison either. And really one of the things that this comes down to that I've heard from so many commissioners so far um, is that there's just not a lot of data. I think the planning staff are trying to come up with a, a standard, which is a wise thing to do, but we don't have enough data to do it. Um, I don't believe that the standard that was created for this is actually applicable uh, to the, the type of housing unit. Um, and I, again, I just come back to this is bad planning. I mean, I've got a townhome project that's being built on Main Street in District 6. It's replacing a surface car lot um, with uh, about 20 units and it'll have 21, I think, or whatever parking spaces. Um, and that is, uh, even that amount of parking, I would actually argue in, in five points is more than is necessary. Uh, over a third of the land in five points is surface parking. We have too much surface parking in five points. We don't need more. Um, and so again, I, I just kind of come back to like, this is not really the way to address this particular problem. The problems that exist um, between compliance uh, are made worse potentially by putting in a very large parking requirement uh, which sort of, if anything, encourages people to, to try to get an owner-occupied permit, which is impossible. It's impossible for codes to prove that someone does not live somewhere, right? So that is something that we struggle with a lot with the codes department. And what I really think we need to be doing uh, as Metro Council and as the Planning Commission and, uh, and the codes department is listening to our code staff who are charged with enforcement listen to them what the problems are and what do they feel like the, the potential solutions are. And that's how we should drive our legislation and not over kind of anecdotal problems, which I'm very sympathetic to. Um, a couple of years ago, District, District 6, when short-term rental permits were first implemented by the city, um, for the, at that time there was a 3% cap uh, per census tract. District 6 was sold out immediately. 
um, at, at that time. And and I will honestly say that you know we we had some really egregious behavior uh, at that time. I was in the news all the time about it. Um, but since that time, I mean, I, I would also say that a lot of that has kind of settled down. Um, we, uh, from my code's complaints for property standards, um, uh, a third to a half of them are people complaining, you know, there's a car that's parked on the street that has a flat tire and they want it towed. Um, it's about there's cars that are parked on the grass. I mean, residential, regular old residential parking creates codes problems. I mean, it does. And like this, this sort of solves a parking problem by enforcing more surface parking or garage parking, which is not at all what we want, especially in urban areas. Um, it, it's just, you know, again, I mean, from a data standpoint, I, I appreciate what staff are trying to do, which is to come up with a standard, but this is not it. And, uh, and I think that uh, trying to, to legislate this in the absence of, uh, of data or, uh, or a comprehensive plan or a lot of buy-in from the codes department is, is just a bad idea um, at this stage. It's a great conversation to have started, but this is not the answer. And so one of the things I, I would like to ask, if I can, of perhaps of our legal counsel, is since so far, and I know I have two more commissioners that get to speak, but um, since I've heard a lot of uncertainty from the commissioners so far um, about this legislation, um, after, to, after this planning commission hearing, like how does pending legislation doctrine work or when, when would this law sort of become effective for the, say, for the purposes of permitting? Yeah, so, yeah, so I think that, I think that, um, Right now, you know, you have a pending bill, so anything that would frustrate that um, would be considered, you know, would would act against it. So you, you, it would currently be pending. It would extend that time period, even if you deferred it or um, it it didn't go forward. You'd still be in the in the window of it until it's concluded. So, so this legislation is currently pending. Is that accurate? Is it, is there a council bill on this? There is a council bill and it has been introduced in first reading, but I don't think it would actually be formally pending until you all make a recommendation and you all haven't made a recommendation yet. Okay. okay I think yeah, both yeah, things have correct. to happen, first reading and a planning commission recommendation. And so it's not currently pending. Now, I will say that in regards to the bill timing though, that it was introduced some time ago at council. And so it is beyond the 30 days of um, when it's been referred to the planning commission. And so if you all were to, um, defer it, it could still have a public hearing um, at the council next Tuesday, or no. December 6th. December, yeah, what, yeah December 7th. Um, and then third reading would be, we could still hear it again prior to third reading. But the council rules essentially say that it can't have second reading until it's got a planning commission recommendation or 30, minute, 30 days have passed since it was referred and the 30 days have passed. And so the council public hearing could move forward regardless of your action tonight. Uh, thank you. Well, um, I, I just, you know, again, I, I totally understand the neighborhood concern. Certainly in, in some of our urban neighborhoods, we do have a lot of, you know, we have our restaurant uses, we have entertainment venues, live music venues, we have very large office buildings that spill over into the street. In some communities, we have large employers, universities. I mean, parking is, it's always a challenge, especially in our urban neighborhoods. It's always a source, source of tension. And, uh, and so I empathize with that, but I just feel like this is uh, not a good solution. And, and if we are going, if the Planning Commission and hopefully the Metro Council would follow that, but if the Planning Commission, we're gonna make a recommendation on what is appropriate parking for what is by all accounts meant to be a transient lodging use that we would uh, work with a little bit more of a stakeholder group than it sounds like what has been engaged so far in order to derive what that answer should be. So, so for purposes of clarity in the process, not really knowing where everyone's gonna go, if we defer, then the council may not hear some of the discussion today. But if we recommended disapproval or we recommended something with comments, that would be, we would have the opportunity to transmit that over. 
at that, and so that would we would have the benefit of that discussion at the hearing, correct? That, that's right. So um, I, I think you all know this, but for council public hearings, we prepare staff reports that go with the council public hearings for any zoning bills that are on a public hearing. And so it would include your recommendation if one is made. If it's deferred, then there would be no essentially information given to the council prior to the public hearing. We will prepare a similar report before committee, um, planning and zoning committee, which takes place typically on third reading. And so if you all were to make a recommendation on the 9th, then the information would be transmitted to them for prior to the committee hearing and third reading. So, but it wouldn't be to them prior to the council public hearing. Mr. Johns, are you, Councilman, are you finished? I want to make sure. No, I just want to thank the legal and, and all the staff for that helpful analysis. So. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Johns. Thank you. Um, so when I read uh, this as a Title 17 amendment, I understand staff recommendation because short-term rental has evolved. So not owner-occupied is not the residential use, rather commercial use. So removing residential from that section makes sense. And then if we think this as a commercial use, uh, makes sense to require parking. Uh, so, so having said that, in a practical point, you know, hotel uh, require one parking spot per room and plus employee, you know, two parking, uh, one parking spot per two employee. So that's the hotel requirement. And then hotel is UZO, one room per, one space per one room plus four employee per lot. So there's a difference. So if we were to have like a MUN building, you know, we do have certain parking requirement. So it's like a 16 unit. I think we uh, give or take, we require 20 something, correct? I, I'm just kind of ballparking. It, it, so for multifamily? Yeah, multifamily. So for multifamily within the UZO, the parking requirement is based on the number of bedrooms. So if it's a one bedroom in a UZO, it requires one parking space. If it, it, and so this would be, this wouldn't impact that. If it's a one bedroom, it's one to one. Okay. Um, two bedrooms within the UZO are 1.5. Mm -hmm. um, three bedrooms are also 1.5. And so the number of, and three bedrooms and above. Um, so the number of spaces that are required are based on the bedroom count. That changes outside of the UZO, um, where it's one space for one bedroom, two spaces for two bedrooms and then a half a space for any bedrooms above two. That's for multifamily. It's different for single family and two family. So it depends on the size and the bedrooms for multifamily. Right, thank you. So I was thinking that practical point because you know we all know we build a building and then short-term rental permit comes after because there's no such short-term rental building permit. So, you know, people build a building, and then, you know, after a building was ready and occupied, then apply for short-term rental. And then, let's say all the houses are three-bedroom, and then they want to have three-bedroom unit, short-term rental. But let's say if the unit is a UZO, so they don't require three parking spots. So there's conundrum, what do you do? So I think it's good intention, understand, clean up the bill as currently written, but parking requirement is not practical. So that's what I'm having problem. Because if we were to have certain unit, uh, like you know, two unit, uh, two space per unit, regardless of bedroom, understand it, you know, so because some area, our parking requirement for multi-housing are, you know, point, uh, 1.5 or 0 0.8. So if the parking requirement meet with a building, you know, requirement, regardless short-term rental, I can see that. But, you know, everybody has three bedroom and everybody want to have a three bedroom short-term rental. Then all of a sudden, all unit has to have a three bedroom parking which 
physically impossible. So that's my, you know, uh, kind of conundrum right now. So if the language is cleaned up in line with the parking, actual parking requirement, I think it's cleaned up the uh, current uh, mess in the Title 17, but the parking requirement per bedroom, per short-term rental unit is not in line with what we are trying to accomplish. So my recommendation to, you know, uh, council member is just clean up that language, the not bedroom requirement, but in line with building parking requirement, something makes sense. And then I can support it, but right now, I can certainly support uh, the cleanup of language, removing residential, uh, that's a given, but uh, the parking requirement, I think still need to work on that actual number. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair. Um, I think what Commissioner Johnson summed it up really well just now. I think um, I agree that we should clean it up and take the residential out of the, of the co um, title but I think that we need to go back to the drawing board with what the parking requirement is. I think, to, as, as Commissioner Johnson just said, you know, we should look at, these are, these are units within a building and that building has certain parking requirements that are in place before that building is, you know, before it becomes a short-term unit. So we should look at that, um, I think, as a better way to try to not, not thinking about it as a hotel. A hotel is built as a hotel. We know the parking requirements up front. These are not built to be hotels up front. So, um, so I would make a motion that we disapprove staff's recommendation. And um, I don't think it's necessary to try to break apart this right now. I think that we should ask the council member um, to come back recognizing our concerns and with a new suggestion for what that parking requirement is. That's a proper motion. Motion is to disapprove and uh, is there a second? Second. All right. Proper second. Any discussion? S uh, Commissioner Henley? I just have a question, and mostly for this to be on the record, just because I think our ultimate goal is for a solution. Is it possible for us to propose that short-term rental permits are considered during the building phase? Because I think that's one thing is Commissioner Withers um, very eloquently brought to light is not owner occupied and owner occupied operate very similarly when they're rented, right? And so to me, you know, you have hotels that are in commercial spaces that are considered during the development design period, and then you have owner occupied, usually it's a finished product and you're able to assess it. I'm just curious if we have new construction and it has like some kind of time period that says you have to either wait for so long or, you know, something that, because again, you, you're thinking about how to incentivize or I guess de-incentivize the wait until right after it's done to do it. I'm just curious if that's something that might be worth, so, I don't know how we passed it along, but. So Commissioner, that is a, a very good idea. Uh, it seems very logical. Um, you know, it's something that I think, um, w when we talk about these things, you know, uh, new ideas. And so now that I think the director is gonna take note of that and that we are gonna, um, uh, it would be great if, if you and the director could talk more and then we can figure out a strategy. And sometimes if it's more complex, we have a workshop, we develop out the policy, we talk to the council members, um, the team will talk to the council members and try to figure that out. So very, very good question. Um, and I, I think it's an appropriate thing to, to discuss and to, um, and so that's kind of the process. On this particular bill, you know, um, appreciate the comments. Uh, anything else, Commissioner? Nope. Uh, nope. Okay. So um, I know the director and you will, will, will discuss that and we'll come up with a plan. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in, uh, in favor of the disapproval say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. It's unanimous. And so the situation we are in, we've been here three hours and two minutes. Maybe a little bit longer, and I know that I have to use the restroom, and I apologize for that. And I'm sure that several <laughs> others <laughs> may have to use the restroom. Um, and so we're going to. How about we, commissioners? Would it be okay if we take a quick 10-minute break, and then we'll come right back and finish up? I think we don't have a ton of time left in the meeting, but uh, in sake of me making it, all right. So we'll take a quick 10-minute break.
break. We really appreciate it. So we've completed item 17. We are now on to item 18. But let's, so these items were on the consent. And so sometimes folks end up leaving. And so I just want to make sure that there's still opposition. So on item 18, is there anyone in, in, the, in the audience that is opposed to item 18? OK, so let's hear it. Okay. Oh, okay. Every microphone is different. Um, my name is Amelia Lewis, and I will be presenting item number 18 tonight. Um, so this is a proposed text amendment related to bars and nightclubs, or bar or nightclub. Um, the proposed amendment really does uh, three main things. Uh, the first is that it creates a definition for bar nightclub. Um, the second is that it modifies uh, several districts where a bar or nightclub is permitted um, by right to a use permitted with uh, conditions. And the third and kind of largest part is that it implements a distance requirement from um, a bar and nightclub to the following uses. Uh, single family residential, two family residential, daycare center, um, up to 75 and over 75, a daycare home, school daycare, orphanage, monastery, or convent, religious institution, or community education. Um, so we'll kind of go through those three main things that it does. Um, first is that um, currently bar nightclub is a use that's uh, permitted in our code, um, but it's actually not defined by the code. Um, so the first part of this proposed text amendment would be to create a definition for that. Um, the proposed definition um, is a bar nightclub, meaning any establishment primarily engaged in preparing and serving alcoholic beverages for immediate consumption. Um, these establishments may also provide limited food services. So this is in contrast to like a restaurant where they're, they also have a bar and they serve alcohol, but their primary goal is to serve food. And the distance requirement that's proposed would be um, a minimum of 100 feet from the property line of one of those uses that we talked about um, to the uh, proposed bar or nightclub. Um, so I tried to make a little demonstration on the screen, if you can see it. Um, so the northern or parcel up top has a bar located on it. Um, hypothetically, in this instance, there's a single family lot behind that. And there has to be um, a minimum of 100 feet from that bar to the property line of that use. Um, so our analysis really focused on two main things. Um, the first would be uh, the potential for creating any non-conforming uses. So any bar or nightclub that exists today, that if these conditions were passed, would no longer be compliant with them. Um, it would become a non-conforming use. Um, so for any non-conforming use um, or bar or nightclub, these uses would be uh, permitted to remain um, and continue operating um, and have certain protections for them as well. Um, the second would be the potential for limiting areas. So we looked at um, understanding how the proposed amendment would create buffers and if it's still leaving ample room for these uses to exist. Um, so overall, we kind of found um, that it does limit certain areas, um, but still leaves many areas that would permit the bar nightclub use um, along corridors and in key locations. Um, staff recommends approval of the proposed text amendment. Thank you. And so we'll open this item for public hearing. And the... Councilman Taylor is the applicant, and so he is, is Councilman Taylor is not here. Um, did he send a letter or any supporting documents? I can't remember. Um, so Councilman Taylor had to be out of town for work, and so he sent Councilmember O'Connell here on his behalf earlier, who spoke on this during the um, Councilmember comments portion of the meeting. Okay. All right, so we will, um, is there anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Thanks for coming. And, and state your name and, and address for the record. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Commission and staff. My name is Jackson Zeitlin. Currently re reside at 1822 Fifth Avenue North. 
Um, I am a former District 21 resident under Brandon Taylor, and I'd like to acknowledge that there are certain uh, nightlife uses that can be a nuisance to residential neighborhoods, uh, mainly noise and parking seem to be the common two. Um, similar to the STR discussion, I think we already have zoning uses that restrict the placement of these venues that are pretty satisfactory, um, and we already have neighborhood noise ordinances and a uh, citywide transit plan that we're trying to use to address some of the parking considerations. Um, I have objections to the definition, but we'll keep my objections to the distance requirement as that's within the scope of planning here um, for five main reasons. Uh, one, the number of residentially zoned lots far outweigh commercially zoned and multi-use zoning ones. And I don't think it'd be wise to restrict commercial uses as Nashville continues to grow, um, especially within the councilman's district, um, the neighborhoods that this border, uh, Elizabeth Park and Buena Vista, um, don't have a whole lot of commercial corridors and cannot be serviced by that many commercial uses in general. Um, two, this removes a use that serves as a community gathering place um, and thereby a quality neighborhood resource. Um, we all have met good people and spent time in bars and nightlife, um, and that's part of the Nashville culture. Um, three, I think having a bar and nightclub incentivizes complimentary businesses, late night food service, um, things like that that will be necessary for Nashville to continue to grow and be on pace to become the class of city that it is. Uh, four, restricting the land use reduces its value, plain and simple. Um, and five, by amending the code and not implementing a neighborhood reason or overlay, this bill would adversely impact many secondary arteries outside the councilman's district and would unnecessarily reduce desirability of many secondary urban neighborhoods, Germantown, McFerrin Park, Park, Edge Hill, Elizabeth Park, Wedgwood Houston, so on and so forth, that would be great candidates for Nashville nightlife. Um, and I just have a question, which would be, um, are there the uses that would be non-conforming grandfathered in, or will they cease with the transfer of business should this be implemented? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, the councilman's not here, and um, he's the applicant, so... Um, seeing no one else switching to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Sims, do you want to go first? Uh, I'd rather not. This is okay. complicated for me. So let's well, we'll, we'll try. How about how about Commissioner Henley? Let's try him, <laughs> okay. and then we'll we'll come back. Uh, oh, well, I, I know we only had one person come up to speak, and, and that one person was in opposition. But I, I, I guess to share the com or to further the comment from my fellow commissioner, I, I do think it's a little bit complicated. I think. We don't have enough people here because I don't think they understand it. Um, and I think, you know, I do have a couple of questions to help me better understand it. Um, so I'll start there. The 100 feet, where, what is the basis and why, is, why was that distance chosen? So as is common with a lot of text amendments that are proposed by council members, um, that was the distance that the council member proposed. Um, this is a council member driven text amendment and so then we are led to analyze that with which we are presented. Um, and in this case, I will tell you that upon this being presented to us, we were actually quite um, trepidatious about the, pres about the proposal and, and weren't um, and, and actually asked the council member to defer from the last meeting to allow staff to do further analysis on the proposal. Um, because we thought that it was going to be much more limiting um, than what the reality bears out, especially in urban areas where you have alleys that typically separate some residential. And I did wanna clarify that it's from a residential use, not from residential zoning. Um, and so it would be the residential use of a property, not necessarily from a residential zone. Um, and so that can make a difference in some places. But what we found, um, uh, honestly, was that it was not as limiting as we anticipated and that um, Gallatin Pike, uh, Dickerson Pike, some of your main corridors where you see a lot of commercial activity are going to continue to be able to remain and have that. Even Five Points, um, which Councilmember Withers and I looked at together, um, is, is largely unimpacted um, because of lot configuration. So, so we, were, we analyzed that with which we were given and found it to be appropriate. I also, I do think it's interesting, particularly coming from Councilmember Taylor, the way his, his district is shaping and growing. I mean, it, it, it's not like five points. It is structured a little bit differently. It is one of the few corridors that have that use and accessibility. And I think also it, it's a community that's character is honestly being built around itself as somewhat of an arts and entertainment district. And so, it, again, I, I'm slightly confused by that. 
Um, the other question I did have, and, and it was also addressed by, by the person who spoke in opposition, um, it, it seems as though we're saying that they will, uh, existing businesses will be grandfathered in. That may be why we didn't have as many people here speaking in opposition, because they feel as though they'll be safe, for lack of a better term. Um, but, but I think there was a very important question that was brought up, and so I'm curious how, how that would be treated, you know, grandfathered in as in the property and the use, or is it as it transitions with the sale or re, I guess, you know, you can also just sure. change or retitle sure. the, the um, title. Certainly. Property. So a non-conforming use actually travels with the land, not with an owner. So if the use of the property is bar not club, it could change hands. It could be a different bar not club. So the use of bar not club is actually travels with the land, not with an owner or a particular name or a particular business. Sorry. So I, I guess now my question is, we're creating a new description for bar nightclub that does not currently exist, as I understand it. It's a newer designation. So if I'm going to play developer, I like to wear that hat. So I see a restaurant that is struggling, and it is currently a restaurant. Um, this passes, and then I say, you know what? This probably just needs to be shifted to a bar or a nightclub. It probably would thrive better. Um, I'm now prohibited because you now have a new designation and I'm trying to seek the new designation. I, th that's kind of where I'm at is right. We're, we're further carving out something that seems to be restrictive. Well, not necessarily. Okay. So bar nightclub is a separate use in our zoning code right now. So restaurant, um, uh, quick service or yeah, restaurant, fast food, restaurant, takeout, restaurant, full service are all individual uses. Bar nightclub is an individual use. Those other uses I just mentioned are defined. Mm -hmm. Bar nightclub is not defined. And so all of this does is add a definition, but it doesn't add a new use. So it just defines a use that already exists in the code. Um, and so the, the differentiation between, and some of it has to do with state law, and the differentiation, differentiation between bar nightclub and restaurant typically uh, rests on the percentage of sales that come from food. And so you can be a restaurant that has alcohol sales, you can be a bar that has food sales. The classification of if you are a restaurant or a bar depends on the sales of food. I, I, I understand. I think that it's, it's still it's, it's newer definition and regulation that's not currently there. Not that that's a bad thing. I, I remember sitting on the on the CARES Act committee and we had to dive into a lot of that when when folks were trying to be categorized as a live venue and how much revenue was generated from tickets. So I understand there's there's ways to do it. I don't necessarily I don't necessarily agree with those the way that it's done, but I, I do understand it. I, I understand better. I don't necessarily have a way that I'm leaning. I, I appreciate being acknowledged here. I think I'll listen to the other commissioners. Well, I, I do have a follow-up question that, that Commissioner Henley spurred. So could it be, under the definition, could it could it be a brewery? That, so that's a separate use, actually. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I just... brewery would be classified as brewery. So it's a separate use. There's actually nano brewery and regular brewery, and that is a completely separate use um, from bar, nightclub, or restaurant. What about like a um, beer garden? Uh, it doesn't serve a lot of food. So that would likely be community uh, or um, entertainment outdoor. I mean, that... We have like hundreds of uses in the zoning code. And so if there's not a specific use of beer garden, then it would be up to the zoning administrator to determine how that use is classified. Okay. Okay. And I also did want to mention as well that there is the, so if you had a situation where someone wanted to go to this use that was a restaurant and they wanted to change to the bar and then they were precluded from doing so, there is the opportunity to go to the BZA for a variance. Um, so you can all, you could go to the BZA to ask for a variance from this particular um, zoning code requirement. I, so I mean I I probably should wait for everyone else to speak, but I just think sometimes we get <laughs> to you know without the council being here with the, I'm sure there's some type of example or something, but I think you're starting to this is a countywide code. It's you know it, it could affect a lot of um, community spots where I think you know. The term bar or just gathering place is sometimes a healthy thing in a neighborhood, and I, I just think that limiting it so that you move away from the community or residential, that's, I, I probably shouldn't say anything, but thank you, Commissioner. All right, Councilman, let's 
keep uh, Thank you, Chair. And uh, again, I, I thank the council member for bringing this legislation so we can have a good discussion about it. Um, I will not um, shy away from the fact that when I read this, I was alarmed um, because, you know, uh, the Five Points area has bars next door to houses and um, many people who moved to uh, Five Points moved there specifically for that. Like they wanted to have a place that they could walk to um, where they could enjoy an adult beverage, possibly listen to some live music, uh, any of those things. Um, we have restaurants too, but uh, the bar uses have a, a very particular appeal uh, in certain kinds of urban neighborhoods. And sometimes it's in Five Points proper, sometimes it's little spots that are much, much further back. Um, I, I kind of harken back to the days of what we used to call the old, old family wash, which was what my neighborhood, that was our hangout spot. Now they did serve shepherd's pie, which I, I understand is being reintroduced at another venue and we will all be up there having reunions. But, um, but that is really important in a lot of the urban neighborhoods and for a lot of folks who move to urban neighborhoods, they move there for, sort of for that. They want to have that nearby. And so I was kind of alarmed um, and was kind of struggling to understand it. Uh, I do appreciate staff for spending, talking me off the ledge on this a little bit, um, but I'm still at this point where I don't know that I fully understand all the legalities enough even to articulate to my, either the neighbors who may have a concern about a bar or a bar owner, I don't know that I can articul articulate that well enough right now to even explain to constituents how this would work or not uh, as it pertains to their business. And that makes me really, really concerned. I'm relieved that at least most uh, bars or restaurants would be legally non-conforming uses. I don't, that in particular, I don't know how that, and maybe legal counsel could share with us, but, um, you know, if they want to add onto their building and they want to add a covered patio on the back, which a lot of them do, is that going to be a problem for them if, if they're now legally non-conforming use, for instance? But that's something that really came up in the last year is folks wanting to have outdoor dining and they're sort of using space that used to be a parking lot, but using it as a, as a service area for patrons, uh, particularly in the era of COVID, and how would this affect that? I mean, I know that that's kind of a one-time thing, but, but I also think that that's a real trend. I mean, 15 years ago, Nashville didn't have a lot of alfresco dining at all. Um, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of independent restaurants at all 15 years ago, um, but now that's what everyone sort of wants. There's a premium for, uh, for outdoor dining and drinking spaces at, at our businesses. And to the extent that the city has made it a little bit easier for you to say, well, we'll let you take three or four parking spaces and, and have that be part of your service area, is that is that gonna be a potential problem now? I mean, maybe there, there are just so many unknowns about that that I, I'm really kind of struggling with, with this legislation um, being something that I think a lot of people uh, in town uh, haven't, it hasn't bubbled its way up to the media, which so far is good. I think every, everyone's been emailing the council about how much they hate paying $9 and waiting in a line for emissions. That has been the 80% of constituent correspondence for the last couple of weeks. Um, but this one hasn't really bubbled up. I haven't seen a lot of press coverage of it. I just don't know that the community really knows about it. And you know, it's up to people to pay attention, but even for myself as a council member, you know, I try to be able to articulate to my constituents how this would work or not, and I just don't know. Um, and, and that really concerns me a lot about this at, at this stage. And so I'm at, at the point where, you know, I, I respect the council member, would love if council member Taylor were here to help us understand what's going on. But I uh, am, am reluctant to vote in, in support of something today, even as a planning commissioner, just without having the Metro Council body I mean, I'm sure we'll have great staff analysis and everyone could read the analysis, but I, I just feel like we haven't really had an opportunity to say, what's the problem? Is this the solution? What are the unintended consequences of that? Um, how many businesses are affected? I mean, it sort of is like the last bill. Um, and I really, really would want to hear from the business owners themselves. I mean, in particular, I've got a lot of independent restaurants. We've got the Nashville Originals and a lot of those small business owners that, you know, every, every small matter of 
uh, parking or things like that are really vital to them surviving. And I, I would wanna know, like, have, have organizations like that been engaged? And if so, what is their, what is their take on it? Um, so th th those are just some of my concerns with, with, with you, what Kevin. we have in front of us right now. Appreciate Thank it. You. So that, you, you're begging the question on where is it in the council? What's the, pro where is it at? Hi, so this is in a similar situation to the last text amendment that we just heard in that we asked the council member to defer it from the last meeting to provide staff additional time to do analysis, including sort of some geographic analysis in regards to where these uses are currently permitted today versus where they would be permitted uh, if this were to pass. Um, and so this bill was introduced more than 30 days ago. The public hearing is scheduled for December 7th. And so um, regardless of the decision that you all make tonight, it can continue um, through to the public hearing. Um, you would have a chance to opine on it um, December 9th, if you were to defer one meeting um, prior to it being heard on third reading at the council. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Um, actually, it didn't bother me because this uh, use was strictly applied to bar and nightclub. Uh, it excludes restaurant, so cafe, you know, food establishment, coffee shop, it doesn't apply to those. So it's just strictly bar and nightclub. So just have a distance requirement for those establishment for the future use is, that's what we are trying to kind of regulate. For in that instance, it really didn't bother me. It kind of cut quite clear to me. So I sort of agree with our staff recommendation because it's just, clean cut and, you know, DTC, no distance requirement. But outside of DTC, you know, uh, risk, uh, distance requirement with condition, kind of appropriate to me. But since uh, there's so many uh, gray area and intention of the council member, so if we can, yes, I do understand, you know, our other commissioner's uh, concern. So, uh, but, I would love to hear from a vice chair and, you know, uh, fellow commissioners <laughs> where they are. Vice chair, your name was called. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that anytime we're doing something countywide, we need to look at it at, at multiple neighborhoods within the county. So I know, you know, I'm not totally familiar with how Buchanan is redeveloping. Um, but, you know, I do think we should go and, and look at other similar neighborhood commercial centers and, you know, where we know there's a vibrant nightlife um, and, and see how this would impact those neighborhoods as well. So I would prefer to see a little more analysis before supporting this. We, we do have some maps that we are happy to pull up. We can show it's just if it's up to you all. So this is Buchanan Street. Um, and I wonder if I can Zoom. I don't think you can, Amelia. Yo, look at that. Oh, Amelia. <laughs> Got some tricks up my sleeve. Um, so the, and it, I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see, but the purple um, is the area or are the parcels in which they are zoned to permit a bar and nightclub. Um, the gray buffer would be, um, so you can kind of see how the neighborhood is all faded out and then it really starts to come in at the rear of the parcels um, up against the corridor um, in that kind of gray color. Um, and so in instances where, um, oh, you can't see my mouse, um, but towards Buchanan, like the label of Buchanan Street, you can see that gray that starts to cross. Um, but in areas that are purple without any gray over it, um, a bar nightclub would fall within that boundary um, and would be permitted. Um, so my understanding is that still even based on a depth of a parcel, it could be permitted on a portion of a parcel. Yeah, com yeah. Commissioner Blackshear is not gone yet, and then and then you can get you you. Now that I learned, now that I learned. All right, Commissioner Blackshear, go ahead. 
Um, well, that was really helpful. I was wondering, obviously, Councilman Taylor is being responsive to the constituents in his district. I was wondering how many um, legally non-conforming uses we will be creating in the county and whether we've heard a lot of complaints from those areas and are we basically stifling um, the creation of more um, positive entertainment districts in the future by um, adding this in, I guess, um, it would be helpful to hear, um, I really respect Councilman Taylor, so it would be helpful to hear him, his thoughts about that. And then also, um, to piggyback on Commissioner Henley's question about why the 100 feet was chosen, I don't know if there's like a certain like level at which volume starts to not travel beyond certain feet, like why is, I don't know, maybe there was like an actual calculation as to why 100 feet as opposed to 75 or 60. So I have questions regarding it. Um, I think like Commissioner Johnson, just looking at it, it doesn't seem completely controversial and like daycares and homes being away from bars and nightclubs. But I, I do have some questions surrounding it and making sure that we're doing the right thing by passing the legislation as written. Um, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, I did want to say Council Member Taylor, although he is out of town, is watching. The, the meeting. And um, so he did uh, let me know that he would be okay with a deferral um, to allow um, additional time and that he is willing to also defer the public hearing at council um, so that you all are able to um, give feedback prior to the council public hearing happening. So um, he did say that he was, was willing to defer. I'm happy to try to answer the, some of those questions as well if you would like me to go ahead and do that. But I did want to let you know that late breaking news. <laughs> so. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's, yeah. I, I know. I'm, I'm passing it out. <laughs> that's awesome. I'd be really um, happy to hear what he has to say. I mean, obviously, I don't want to steal the attempt that you may have to answer some of those questions. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think he would probably have a lot of really good information for us. Mr. Yeah. Sams, you're I just want to thank my colleagues for teaching me. This was really complicated for me, and y'all know a lot more about this than I am, even at this point. Um, the one thing I do want to say is I do know that Councilman Taylor, I walked this whole area and really looked at it. It's He's addressing some serious issues right here, and so I don't know how we can prioritize some of the things that are happening as our urban core changes so much um, versus the countywide. But... I do feel a sense of urgency that he feels on this. So, so um, I, you know, we are the music city, right? And so I, I guess I look at it as a, um, from a different perspective. I, I, I think I need to hear kind of the situation and, and uh, you know, maybe it's a, a one place issue or, or maybe it's kind of like what the vice chair said that when it has full countywide situation, I would hate to limit new music venues. And I, I share the same sentiments as the councilman from, from East Nashville. I just think we need to be really careful when you have, uh, this happening. I love councilman Taylor. I think he's a great guy. He's very smart. Um, and I appreciate him wanting uh, the able to defer. So we heard that. How many meetings, Lisa, did he say? Can we do one one meeting? But I, I just feel like, you know, potentially this could limit a lot of areas in, in town that I think, and maybe it's something we can address. But is there a deferral motion? Is there somebody, will, a commissioner willing to make a deferral motion for one meeting? I think Commissioner Blackshear was kind of saying that. Commissioner Bush. I'm, I'm moving that we defer this item for one meeting. That's proper motion. Second. Any other discussion? Well, I guess just in terms of what we want from staff, I think it would be good to hear from the councilman directly, but then I do think it would be helpful to look at a few other pockets. Um, I don't exactly know what to suggest in the terms of the pockets. Um, I mean, five points obviously comes up. Um, 12 South. 12 South. Yeah. No, some... Some of the more entertaining district the areas. Nations. nations. So just some of the other that are really abutting, the you know, Creep Hall. Center. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> 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 I think that would be it's a Creep Hall joke. And, and then when, also the, and, and then helping us understand if there's connections to other things that might be tying it to that 100 foot right. and kind of how that's selected. 
Commissioner Blackshear. Yeah, and when thinking about like the other areas to study, if there can be some type of compilation of any type of noise complaints or any type of problems that have been associated with those areas, so we can see how widespread the issue is. Uh, Commissioner Hanley. Yeah, I think this this map in some of those areas that we requested, so we can kind of see that and just, I just requested it's not purple and gray because it's difficult to see. <laughs> um, maybe like really sharply contrasting colors just yeah. for ease of review. Um, but I'm just curious, I mean, I understand creating a, a buffer between, you know, the particular use and then the residential uses. But for me, I just think about, I mean, you have to have some transition along these commercial corridors. And so I just think about, I mean, what are you doing with, eight to nine stories of distance between a, a structure and a, a property line. Like, what, what do you do with that space then? I mean, from an urban development standpoint, I mean, do you, is it just a parking lot, right? I mean, if you have those instances, not that it doesn't need to be addressed on a larger scale, but I'm, I really am curious about that particular distance and maybe if there's some way to yeah, rein I mean, in on what that thought process is or what, what a better, um, I guess a, a better restrictive type of use. Maybe it's not a distance that's that great, or maybe it has a certain condition that goes along with it or something. Because I just, I have a hard time just picturing 100 feet from a property line across the county and just saying it's a good idea. I just, it's just hard for me. And I, that's great, Commissioner. I, that's a, a very good analysis. I think another thing for me is uh, that the councilman had stated was expansion and whether that's an outdoor expansion or Many restaurants, no, I don't want to say restaurants, bars or nightclubs and restaurants have expansion plans. They do really well. They need to build in the back. And so if that makes it a non-conforming use, can they get the building permit? Um, and or if they sell it to a next person. I think there's many, a lot of questions that could potentially create all sorts of legal issues. I'd all right. Like to see us yes. Commissioner um, Sims. I would like to see us address... Um, cases like this where this is not just one incident, this is impacting a whole, well, actually our plans for growth in this area. And it, this is happening more often in the really turbulent areas where turnover is happening a lot. And I don't know what we can do when exceptions are important. And so I don't know how we can brainstorm that a little bit, but he's facing a real problem and whether anybody else in the state, could, well, I know there's several neighborhoods that are facing this. so. Good point. All right, so there's been a motion to defer, second. Um, any other discussion? Uh, and we're deferring one meeting. So all in, uh, in favor of deferring one meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and it's deferred one meeting, and we appreciate the councilman. All right, so now we're on to item 24. Looking at 4321 Old Hickory Boulevard, <coughs> SP rezoning. Uh, rezoned from R15 and R8 to SP for 72 multifamily residential units. Um, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. So the current zoning on the site is R15 on the southern portion and R8 on the northern. However, there's a commercial PUD, two different commercial PUDs that govern the uses that are allowed at this point. Uh, policy on the site's T3 Suburban Neighborhood Center with a little bit of conservation. Here's an aerial showing the site just north of a trampoline uh, park and a gas station. Here's the proposed site plan showing the 72 units with two entrances off of um, Old Hickory Boulevard, uh, private streets. Um, in the southwest corner of the site plan, uh, there's a cell tower. There was some some confusion in the beginning about how great that fall distance was. We were thinking it was 60 or 65 based on some plans, but a resident brought to our attention it's actually 85. So the site plan's been redesigned so that all homes are outside of that fall radius. 
Um, just some details about the plan. It's, as I said, 72 units, 8.82 units an acre, um, three bedroom, mostly one and two car garages uh, with some driveway and surface parking. Uh, units will be no taller than three stories. Uh, like I said, two private drives with gate access for residents. Um, sidewalk connections throughout and two old Hickory Boulevard, a clubhouse and pool in the rear. They're, the units that are along Old Hickory Boulevard will read to be like they face Old Hickory Boulevard, but they will actually face internal to the development. Um, old Hickory Boulevard at this, at this point is a scenic arterial, so there's gonna be some extra buffering and street trees that are provided. So our analysis is it's consistent with the policies on site, T3 Neighborhood Center and Conservation. Um, it's pedestrian friendly, it's near commercial, it'll help connect neighborhoods north and south. Um, the use of garages will reduce some of the surface parking. The small area of conservation is preserved for stormwater. Also, the developer has agreed to extend the sidewalk north to South Fork Boulevard and to contribute $50,000 towards traffic lights, uh, toward a traffic light in that area. And those are uh, included in the, the list of conditions. So our recommendation is to approve the conditions and disapprove without all conditions. I'll just run through the two PUDs real quick that are being canceled for this. Um, so there's two different ones on the north and south zoned differently, but the PUD controls the uses. We've gone through the policy governing the site, the aerials. Uh, the northern site is South Fork Commercial PUD. It's 20,000 square foot of commercial um, with large surface parking and a gas station canopy. On the south side, it's um, the what I say, Granville, Grandview, um, and it's Grand, yeah, and it's 70,000 square foot of commercial. Uh, you can see large surface parking, um, retail and office uses. So, I mean, it, it could be debatable whether this com it's good to see this commercial not being a part of this area anymore, but uh, this plan as is is not really in line with our current goals with, with our Nashville Next plan with all the surface parking and the layout. Um, so again, our, our recommendation is to approve um, if that SP rezoning is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And so we um, will open the public hearing for item 24. And the applicant is in the room. Come on up. State your name and address. You have 10 minutes, and you can save two of the minutes from the 10 for rebuttal. Can you hear me now? There we go. Good evening. Thank you for hearing our proposal to you tonight. My name is Preston Ayer. I'm with SWS Engineering. I'm the civil engineer representing the project. Uh, and my address is 504 Autumn Springs Court, Franklin, Tennessee. Um, Dustin did a very good job of, of everything I was going to I was going to bring up about the project, but I will go over a few additional items. Um, the the cell tower that is on site, uh, we had received two different plans that showed two different fall radiuses for the, for the cell tower. Um, I reached out to the manufacturer and confirmed that it is the 85 foot radius uh, for the, the engineered fall radius for that tower. Um, and so we are showing that all of our townhomes are completely out and then some of that fall radius. Um, the tower will remain and we will provide an access easement through our site so that they are able to still maintain the tower and service the tower if needed. Uh, there's also an existing detention basin that uh, is located behind the tower, it is designed currently to handle the commercial uh, parcel to the south of us, as well as designed to handle um, this PUD, if it were to be built out, we will analyze that detention pond and make any changes to the size or the outlet structure that as required by stormwater. Uh, in addition, we will also provide water quality BMPs, bioretention basins um, throughout our site to also treat the stormwater runoff. Um, we had uh, held two community meetings um, with uh, Councilman Hager and the, uh, the community. And through those meetings is where um, the developer has agreed to pay the $50,000 towards the uh, red light at South Fork, which South Fork is about 400 feet 
to the north of our property frontage. Um, and in addition to uh, helping to pay for the red light, uh, installing also about 400 feet of additional sidewalk uh, that will tie into the sidewalk that we are also providing along our frontage of the pro project. Um, and with that, we agree with staff's recommendation and agree to all the conditions of approval. And I'll reserve two minutes at the end. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate that. We two minutes for rebuttal. And so now uh, we're on to, and Councilman, I see you back there, so I, I'll make sure I, I can uh, The director let me know you're hiding behind the podium. Um, so next, is anyone wishing to speak in, oh, yes, sir. All right, real quick. Also, the, the developers are here as well to answer any questions, so. Okay, thank you. Commissioners may have questions um, after the discussion. So um, is there anyone wishing to speak in support of the project? All right, seeing none, anyone wishing to speak? Councilman, you'll go last, okay. okay. All right, and then anyone wish to speak in opposition? Come on up. You, you, you were, I wanna say thank you for being so patient we really appreciate it. It's all part of it, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Hoffman. I live at 4240 Old Hickory Boulevard, which is directly across the street from South Fork, where these new street stoplights is being proposed. But anyways, the, the proposal of changing all this to residential within the current land use of the, of the community character manual, which is the NC, uh, specifically says locations of prominent intersections are reserved for mixed use and non-residential development unless the applicant can document an appropriate plan-based reason for placing solely residential buildings at a location. The first proposal was a true mixed use with commercial on the front facing Old Ecker Boulevard and townhomes in the back, which to, to me would enhance the, the area. We have approximately a mile and a half north, south, to even get to a store to get eggs and bread. Three miles to the closest grocery store. Anything to enhance would, would be nice, but now we're looking at strictly residential. 73 more homes and a gated community. What, what's that going to do as far as it, it's, it's just going to stick out like a sore thumb against RS, R8 and R15 zoning. So it's really truly not gonna enhance anything in our area. That's, that's why I'm, if, if, we could, if we could compromise between a true mixed use, that, that's fine. But the first proposal was three quarters of an acre out of this total eight, hour, eight, eight acre area to be dedicated to commercial. By the time you get the parking restrictions in there, you're talking about a thousand square foot building. So that's why I'm here in opposition of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming down. All right, two minute rebuttal. Yes, my name is Brent Smith. I'm the developer of the project. And first of all, appreciate Mr. Hoffman coming. Appreciate y'all's time. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to address. One, our price point on these homes are gonna be in the three, in the low threes, 310 to 320, which we think is a much needed price point for homes in the entire metro market um, when he was referring to our initial plan was a, a, it was we did have roughly about 10,000 square feet of retail along the front I've personally when I was with Crescent Resources I've developed about over 3 million square feet of retail throughout the southeast we did our study we looked at what the adjoining property right next to us is a closed grocery store that's now a trampoline market and we also looked at other retail up and down Old Hickory Boulevard. And the only new retail in that area, and I want to be careful how I say this, because it's sort of a Class B retail. Most of your high-end retail, the grocery stores, the restaurants, are all located near the interstate, which is all driven by traffic and population. So when you look at what's best for an area, it's the chicken and the egg approach. You've got to get enough people in a certain area to attract the retail that's going to be needed there that people are wanting. When you've already got existing retail that has failed for some reason, right, it's been there for a long time, but when you've got a grocery store that's gone into a second generation of retail, 
that's a good indicator of that you're needing more population of people there to support that retail. So that's why we've come up with the plan that we've done. Um, and we, so we've, we just feel like that with the need of additional residential property at a price point that is desperately needed in the, in the metro area to keep that price point where it needed to be, we needed to have the retail there. So that was what the elimination of the small amount of retail up front was going to be. So that was our reasoning on how we got to where we are. So we're here for any questions. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, Councilman. Thank you all for allowing me to be here. Is it on? It's on. Good. Uh-oh. Oh, your, oh, your time's up. up. <laughs> time's up, Councilman. Somebody ding me. <laughs> the bomb. Uh, Mr. Hobbins, correct. We had a couple of meetings about this, and we we're going to do some commercial in the front. Uh, let me give you the history of this property. Hampton Park is to the west of it, um, South Forks to the north of it. Uh, this particular property, when the PUD was put on it, I did some research on it. That commercial PUD was put on there back in 1986-87. So this land has sat there vacant for that long, and we had these gentlemen come along and want to do this. And of course, I'm like anybody else. I preferred to have some commercial on the front. But we've had two grocery stores there. We had where the urban uh, jump fair park is. We had food line there. They left and then IGA came in. They just stayed a while and they left. So, you know, I've tried to get grocery stores in that area. Uh, I've talked to Aldi's. Uh, I'm good friends with Miss Martin who owns the Cash Savers and some of the HG Hill stores and They've all said, you know, the market's just not there for that right now. So, since the land's been sitting there so long, I understand any developer has a right to develop their property because it's sitting there vacant. And, you know, this was something that I looked at, and I'm kind of like, I tell everybody, my plan is down through Oh Hickory especially, and I got part of Hermitage, is I keep more of the high-density developments on the main roads, which is Old Hickory and those areas. Well, I have not got a lot of uh, negative comments about this because most people are saying, we know something's gonna go there sooner or later. And they agree with that. They say, you know, we'd prefer to have some commercial property there too. Now, when we started talking about this and I negotiated with the developers, I have a lot of people that walk from South Fork all the way down to the Speedway and the shopping center down there where the urban air park is. So I asked them, well, finish the sidewalks, make them go all the way up to South Fork. South Fork's, South Fork's probably got about 300 houses back in there. So then I asked them, and I'm working with the traffic engineers now to put a red light right there coming out of South Fork Boulevard. Because yeah, Oregon Boulevard is getting very busy. And one of the biggest things we have on Oga Boulevard to O'Hickory, if you look at all your tags that are coming through that area, what's, in, what's happening is people from Wilson County and Rutherford County are cutting through over to Ellington Parkway. And that's increased a lot of our traffic as well. So when I talk to these gentlemen about it, the price point of the townhouses are in the $300,000 range. Most of the houses in Hampton and South Fork are running anywhere from $330,000, $360,000. So they're keeping these houses compatible with what's selling in the area. We've all just discussed material that'll go on these particular townhouses. And then I tried, when we talked about the cell tire in the back, <clears throat> he had some units back there and I wanted to pull them back away from the Hampton Park subdivision so it had a bigger buffer. Of course, the cell tire's back there and you gotta be away from the breakaway point anyway. So they were moved up from there and we reduced it from about 78 townhomes to 72 townhomes. So, you know, I agree with Mr. Hoffman. I'd love to have some commercial on the front, but basically the demographics, the population, the density is not there yet. I've told people until we get more density to support businesses, that's just the way it's going to be. 
And, you know, I don't like that, but that's just the way it is. And I'm supportive of it. Um, and I appreciate y'all passing it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. How about Commissioner Johnson? You haven't gone first yet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Hager, and uh, not only sticking with us this late, but also the history, uh, it really helps. I appreciate that. You know, when I heard from uh, the uh, public, you know, I thought, yeah, why not? You know, uh, mixed use, uh, some commercial and residential, yeah, looks good, I would love that. But uh, I understand, you know, it's nice to hear the council member who's been there a long time and know the history and know the people. So, so knowing that, and we are definitely need more housing, and I think this plan is good. I'm glad this is not, you know, slope, and it's a completely nice area. And I think this uh, new uh, proposal makes sense. So I'm in support of all three uh, agenda. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Chair, for uh, recognizing me. I appreciate uh, Mr. Hoffman for coming out and speaking, uh, referencing the local zoning as well as the policy. I'm always impressed by folks that read the community character manual. Um, we, we do have to recognize that, that it is a policy and sets general guidelines that still have to be applied to a specific location. Um, it is true that, you know, kind of corner commercial uh, is a, kind of ideal. This. Uh, appears to be a much more of a mid-block kind of a location. And so I, I don't know that that portion of the policy would apply to this parcel in the way that it might uh, for a parcel that was, you know, further at a major intersection. Um, I also, uh, you know, agree that a lot of folks want retail. Grocery stores are so incredibly difficult to, to get. I mean, even sometimes it can be very difficult in communities to get something like, let's say, a Dollar General that has groceries. I mean, I would love to get one of those in, in back in the Casey area, for instance. And I hear from constituents quite a bit that have uh, limited mobility that that they would really like to have a grocery store there, and it's just so difficult to do. Um, and so I appreciate Councilmember Hager for kind of calling around to some of those businesses, and I, I think that that assessment from that sector of the of the community is right, that you know they have so much competition from locations that are closer to the interstate or Lebanon Pike or the major, major intersections, that it can be difficult to justify putting in a new, uh, retail or that that would include groceries at some of these locations unfortunately and so um, having said that you know um, this this seems like a, a good plan I appreciate the staff letting us know about the buildings uh, fronting old Hickory and actually addressing the street in some ways I think that's really good so I, th I think this is a, a big improvement over what the PUD that was there previously uh, to get some good density with with at least some good design standards um, I, I think this is a good plan Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Henley? Uh, well, again, you know, very pleased um, from hearing the, the, the price point targets and, and the consideration for housing that we need in our city. I, clearly, I wear that hat in a lot of different ways, and so glad to always be able to address and thank developers who are, who are doing that and have a focus on that. I mean, I, I, hear, I hear it. I mean, it's... It, East Nashville, it's a strong conversation in North Nashville, really wanting to have more commercial access along along corridors that traditionally you think would be great for that, but it is hard to beckon um, some of those commercial users to those spaces until you have that appropriate density. And some of those other other things that, that they consider in terms of demographics, such as disposable income and, and things of that nature. Um, while, while this site ultimately may not be that, because I do think it's a, it's a good plan and a sound plan, I think it does create a stronger beckoning for that for this community. And so I think you know, in the longer term and hopefully not too long term, you know, this development will be one of those things that gets dropped in the bucket that could tip the scale. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm I'm pleased with it. I'm, I'm appreciate the council member for sticking with us and coming here and giving that history and how long ago that PUD was put in place. I think you know Nashville has to adjust to some of the things that were on plans and in and, and writing. Um, the city's changed a lot in the past few years, let alone the past two to three decades. Um, so I just think that context is always very helpful. So thank you for staying around and, and sharing that with us. My comments, Commissioner Sims. I want to thank Mr. Hoffman for being a singular voice. I know what that feels like, so I really appreciate your saying what needs to be said. 
And Mr. Hager, I really appreciate your, your leadership in your community. Um, the, you always put the neighbors first, and I know that they would like to have a grocery store, but and hopefully we'll all get there. I mean, lots of neighborhoods right now are growing fast and need grocery stores, so good luck on that one. I love the way you combined a lot of hodgepodge stuff to come up with something that really makes sense at a price point that we really need as a city. So thank you. I'm really for this. So. Mr. Fletcher. Um, I agree and appreciate my fellow commissioner's comments, and I have nothing further. Vice Chair. I um, don't really have anything further either. Except so I would be happy to make a motion that we've uh, approved staff's recommendation for item 24A. Second. So we have to vote on all three separately. So that's a proper motion. Is there a second? second. So, oh, sorry, missed it. Proper second. Any other discussion on 24A? All in favor of 24A, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Second motion. I would uh, vote to approve staff's recommendation for item 24B, which is the PUD cancellation. Thank you. That's a proper motion and a second. Uh, any other discussion on 24B? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. 24B is adopted. And finally, I would like to make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation on item 24C. That's a proper motion. Second, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it on 24C. That concludes our public hearing items. And so that brings us to other business, which is uh, historic. Any Anything on historic, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, Commissioner Johnson's microphone. Oh, are you, uh, oops, yeah, Johnson, yeah, we. Thank you. You know, I am uh, representing this body to. Uh, hold on, Commissioner Johnson. So if we could, you know, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you coming. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. We're fine. All right, Commissioner Johnson. Well, thank you. I just want to uh, uh, let you know very quickly because uh, I am representing this body uh, at the Historic Zoning uh, Commission. And so it's really important for us to work together. So one of the items, uh, one applicant uh, proposed the do in single family zoning, uh, zoning area. So typically, uh, Historic Zoning Commission's uh, role is not to approve, uh, they don't see dadu as a dadu. It just see the a design and it's appropriate uh, considering in that location, but do not see dadu is kind of left to interpretation of the code administration. But if we do work that way, sometimes human error happens, and intentionally we can create a dadu building. So I was able to point out uh, those things uh, so applicants uh, agree it, it, they will not build dadu and they will entirely change to the pool house to comply with uh, our regulation. So I thought, you know, having a represent from different body, different commission board, it really working well. And I do appreciate, you know, opportunity to serve. Thank you. Uh, nothing from uh, um, <laughs> Parks, Executive Committee Report, Vice Chair, we don't. Uh, just a reminder, we only have one meeting in December, on December 9th, at the normal location. Correct? Correct. Okay. At 4 o'clock. All right. Director, first report. Um, quick look. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Quickly, two things. Um, Greg Claxton did a great job tonight with the team. It's been an enormous amount of work. Um, so two things real quick. Um, I would share since um, we had a couple of items on this agenda that will illustrate the point, that I have had intermediate conversations with the council office um, over time about the manner in which the commission receives citywide text amendments. This commission and the staff, land development staff especially, take very seriously their advisory role to council and like to be as responsive as possible. But as you can see, when we have citywide text amendments, they can come at any time. I believe right now we have more than five 
that are large, that are marinating through the staff with varying degrees of complexity. I think I'm looking at you, Councilman. I'm happy to talk to you offline okay. about this because I have asked questions like, could we go to a three-year kind of thing where we get all of the citywide text amendments at once so we can develop a scope and a research analysis. And because they are so different in terms of the lift, that can be really difficult. But I want you to know I've had those conversations because I can see, and we've known for we've known for our whole lives at the planning staff that it is very hard to do citywide text amendments the way we do. So I would just put that on the table. I welcome input, especially from the council members and former council members about how we could approach that. I have not had success, but it has been something I've raised with multiple council directors and um, I'm willing to continue to push for it. And I think having the commission react this way actually helps because then we can, you know, talk a little bit more about what's needed to analyze certain kinds of projects. So. And yeah, of course. I mean, is there? So I think the issue. If it's one neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, that very well may be that it's an issue everywhere, but it really does help, you know, especially because we have such changing neighborhoods right now to understand, you know. So if text amendments came to us with some sort of sign-on from multiple council members, I think it would help at least me feel a little more comfortable that this is a wide a citywide issue sure I think that's a really good point and often the staff is in a position of just sort of responding there are other instances in which we create the text amendment and we've done all the work and then we go look for a sponsor so they're very different animals but I just want to put that out there and I will keep working on that and councilman I'm gonna work with you on that and we'll we'll, we'll sort out second thing well, you, and Lucy oh, yeah. on that mm -hmm. just I think a lot of times there's not a lot of, and Commissioner Sims is a huge advocate of this but on text amendments I feel like sometimes people don't understand them and there's just not a lot of public input and so I I feel like there needs to to be more public input as well that's my I'll just take no, that's that a answer. great point that's a good point um Sorry to interrupt. yes of course in that note you know, we require a uh, neighborhood community meeting. So text amendment, uh, whomever the sponsor council member has to have engagement with, it can be neighborhood, it can be development, it can be business community. So they do have those kind of sign off before they bring to our body. So we will know all the pros and cons and difference and we can, uh, recommend in accordingly, but <clears throat> I think we would like to ask council member to have those engagement first before bring the bill to our body. So if we can add that. Uh, this is really good feedback and all that I'm happy to continue to share because I'm, com I'm confident there is a more organized way um, and so we'll just need to get there. But if you have other thoughts and you wanna share those with me, these are all great, let me know. Um, second thing really quickly, you might have seen in the news um, that I was up at council earlier this week um, talking about a Department of Transportation grant um, partnership proposal um, that would address some specific issues on the East Bank. Um, they, uh, do, the uh, Department of Transportation, I, well, the um, TDOT, I keep getting the NDOT and the TDOT and all that. So TDOT um, uh, is offering to partner with us. The city would continue to lead design. Um, and so it's a really great partnership um, opportunity to solve some very specific issues on the East Bank. Um, but I wanted to assure all of you that the engagement process continues and is not changed by the partnership. The partnership was important to get in place because um, we want to preserve our ability to get federal and state funding in the future. And unfortunately, those entities are very rigorous in their method. And so if through the partnership, we will make sure all of our subsequent planning work, which will continue to be neighborhood driven and transparent, is done in a way that follows NEPA and those kinds of things. There were several council members who raised concerns about um, the manner in which the partnership was described in the spending plan, which we totally understand, and we will continue to work with council to make sure that the, how 
that's a kind of a different bucket of issues than really the planning department, but we're gonna continue to make sure that we're bringing all of the issues directly to council in a way that makes folks feel comfortable um, with the transformative um, change that is possible um, in the East Bank. So if you have any questions or wanna talk about that with me offline, I welcome the discussion. Um, but all, all really positive in terms of the opportunity there. So thank you so much. All right. To do anything. All right. So thank you, Director. Uh, legislative update, Councilman. Anything in the Council? Well, the biggest thing on the Council's mind right at this moment is redistricting, which we talked about earlier. But I want to, again, reiterate thanks to staff for that. The Council itself is looking at the capital spending plan. Uh, council submissions for the next capital improvements budget have already been submitted, and I think we're probably going to be talking about that probably after the first of the year, I would imagine. But uh, okay. that's a, a really important process. But but also did just want to touch base quickly on um, the, the with with zoning text amendments. I mean, I know I worked with staff on a text amendment, but I had. I th what I think was pretty good outreach on that one and appreciate staff working with me. It is much more narrow when it came to council than it was when it started. Um, and I really think that's, you know, when I think of like say council member Henderson during the last term worked extensively on sidewalk legislation. I mean, there are really, really good countywide zoning text amendments or other text amendments that are um, very technical, but some council members really do the, the work on the front end or at least uh, during the process. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult to limit a council member's ability to introduce legislation, but what is good feedback even for me to experience and to hear from um, Director Kemp and the staff is that um, if council members do submit that and maybe don't do all of that work on the front end, um, that it, it creates a, a real burden on the staff to try to figure something out um, uh, that, and, and to get it, get it ready for a deadline that, that y'all do not control. So that is something that perhaps uh, Director Kempf and I can meet with our new uh, incoming and vet veteran Metro employee council office director <laughs> when she gets uh, when she gets seated after the first of the year to try to find a better process. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. And so is there a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. We're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.